Muy buenos días. Queremos agradecer a todos ustedes por su presencia esta mañana en este curso internacional. Es el curso de sustancia blanca cerebral, anatomía funcional y aplicaciones cirúrgicas. El estudio de la sustancia blanca cerebral permite el conocimiento profundo y preciso de la anatomía topográfica y funcional del cerebro y del tronco encefálico a fin de que el neurocirujano pueda tener una imagen tridimensional de la arquitectura intrínseca del cerebro, que lo guiará durante todo el proceso quirúrgico. Cada neurocirujano tendrá la posibilidad de, de trabajar un hemisferio cerebral con técnicas de Klinger, que permiten el estudio de todos los fascículos y tractos dentro del cerebro, y así poder emplear todo ese conocimiento en cirugía de tumores, epilepsia y funcional. Queremos en esta oportunidad agradecer la presencia de nuestro vicerrector administrativo y financiero, el ingeniero magíster Gonzalo Ruiz Ostre, que está con nosotros. Buenos días, gracias por acompañarnos. El vicerrector académico de la Universidad del Valle, el doctor Diego Villegas, que también está con nosotros. Muchísimas gracias. La vicerectora de Interacción Social, la licenciada magíster Sandra Ruiz Ostria, el directora, la directora académica de la carrera de Medicina, la doctora Georgina Martínez Eid, el presidente de la Sociedad de Neurocirugía de Cochabamba, el doctor Jorge Olmos, el director del Instituto de Neurocirugía de Bolivia, el doctor Richard Párraga, el presidente del Comité de Anatomía de Neurocirugía de la Federación Mundial de Sociedades de Neurocirugía, doctor Vladimir Benes de la República Checa, a los miembros del Comité de Anatomía Neuroquirúrgica de la Federación Mundial de Sociedades de Neurocirugía, el doctor Igor Lima Maldonado, a los doctores disertantes Christopher Destrius de Francia, a la doctora Eka Julianta, de Indonesia, al doctor Ilis Sedmut de Francia, al doctor Julius Julio de Indonesia, al doctor Pablo González López de España y al doctor Roy Thomas Daniels de Suiza. Y también, por supuesto, la bienvenida a todas las comisiones científicas que están con nosotros, a los representantes del Colegio Médico de Cochabamba, médicos, docentes y estudiantes, muy buenos días y muchísimas gracias por estar con nosotros. Inicialmente, queremos invitar a la directora académica de la carrera de medicina, la doctora Georgina Martínez Seid, para que pueda dar las palabras de bienvenida. Gracias, eh, buenos días. En primer lugar, un saludo a las autoridades de la testera, al ingeniero Magíster Gonzalo Ruiz Ostria, vicerrector administrativo y financiero, al doctor Diego Villegas, vicerrector académico de Univalle, a la licenciada Sandra Ruiz Ostria, vicerrectora de Interacción Social, al presidente de la Sociedad de Neurocirugía de Cochabamba, el doctor Jorge Olmos, al director, doctor Richard Párraga, del Instituto de Neurocirugía de Bolivia, y a nuestros invitados extranjeros que se encuentran en la testera y que se encuentran también en, en el auditorio. En primer lugar, a dar una bienvenida a todos nuestros invitados eh, internacionales y también a los invitados nacionales que forman parte de este primer curso de Sustancia Blanca. Como ya mencionaron anteriormente, este curso nos va a permitir poder abordar la masa encefálica desde una, eh, desde una forma tridimensional para que todos los neurocirujanos puedan eh, ingresar a sus cirugías con mayor confianza y poder realizar eh, intervenciones que antes no se podían realizar. Agradecer a nuestros invitados extranjeros de Brasil, de República Checa, de Suiza, de Francia, de Bolivia también, que están presentes. Eh, es importante eh, recalcar que eh, la Federación Mundial de Sociedades de Neurocirugía eh, seleccionaron Bolivia para hacer este evento y dentro de Bolivia seleccionaron Univalle, Cochabamba, para poder realizar este magnífico evento. Muchas gracias por la confianza eh, prestada en la universidad, prestada en la carrera y estamos seguros que nos vamos a defraudar. Eh, también es importante eh, no perder la oportunidad, hoy día es 21 de septiembre y en Bolivia es el Día del Médico. A todos los médicos, a todos los colegas, felicidades. Y también es el Día del Estudiante, así que no se sorprendan, estamos con una fiesta acá en el campus, que también es para todos los invitados extranjeros, o sea que vamos a estar participando de todas las actividades organizadas por la universidad también. Sin más que decir, muchas gracias y bueno, vamos a vernos durante el evento. Gracias.
Muchísimas gracias a la doctora Georgina Martínez, gracias por estar y como bueno ella lo mencionaba y a nombre de la Universidad del Valle, por supuesto nuevamente reiterar las felicitaciones a todos los médicos hoy día del médico en nuestro país, queremos agradecer por el maravilloso trabajo y encomiable que realizan en beneficio de todos y cada uno de nosotros. A continuación vamos a invitar al presidente de la Sociedad de Neurocirugía de Cochabamba, el doctor Jorge Olmos, para que también pueda dar unas palabras en la inauguración de este importante evento. Muy buenos días a todos y principalmente a todos los invitados extranjeros, autoridades de la universidad. A nombre de la Sociedad de Neurocirugía y los neurocirujanos de Cochabamba, pues damos la bienvenida a todos ellos por darse un tiempo para poder participar con nosotros y poder compartir sus conocimientos que son muy importantes para el desarrollo de un neurocirujano. Es así que este curso pienso que va a ser algo muy eh, importante para la, fortalecer nuestras, eh, nuestro conocimiento y todo lo que viene como parte de una formación integral de un neurocirujano. Y asimismo, pues agradezco a todos los invitados y además los participantes y todos los neurocirujanos que acudieron para poder hacer este curso que va a fortalecer en todo sentido a nuestro desarrollo de tipo social, cultural y además intelectual. Bienvenidos a todos, gracias. Las palabras de circunstancia a nombre de la Universidad del Valle estarán a cargo del vicerector académico, el doctor Diego Villegas. Muy buenos días a todos. Saludar a todas las autoridades de la universidad, a nombre del Consejo Rectoral, a nombre del Consejo Universitario y a nombre de nuestro señor rector, el ingeniero Gonzalo Ruiz Martínez, darles la bienvenida a todos, eh, felicito esta actividad, realmente para nosotros como ciudad y como universidad es un honor tener este tipo de cursos de esta talla y de este nivel y que se desarrollen en nuestra universidad, que reúne todas las capacidades y tiene toda la infraestructura para que pueda ser prestada tanto a los profesionales como para los estudiantes. Este tipo de actividades donde se intercambian conocimientos y se adquieren nuevas habilidades, en este caso en, el, en la rama de la medicina, son de vital importancia para ir eh, desarrollando las nuevas capacidades y adquiriendo estos nuevos conocimientos. Estoy seguro que esta actividad va a ser eh, fructífera tanto para los profesionales como para los estudiantes y con seguridad que vamos a intercambiar criterios gracias a la diversidad de puntos de vista que hay en las, eh, por, lo, por parte de los diferentes profesionales a lo largo de estos dos días de los cur, del curso eh, de anatomía, perdón, de, eh, perdón, de sustancia blanca cerebral. No soy del área, entonces les pido disculpas. Pero bueno, felicito y lo mejor en estos dos días Agradecer a todos, los, a todos los profesionales extranjeros por intercambiar estos criterios y les deseo todo lo mejor. También eh, felicitar a los médicos por este día, que tengan un lindo día y como decía la doctora Martínez, pueden darse una escapadita a las actividades que vamos a tener en honor al Día del Estudiante en la Universidad. Eh, les auguro todo lo mejor, felicidades y bueno, suerte en estos dos días. Gracias. Las palabras del vicerrector académico de la Universidad del Valle, el doctor Diego Villegas. Las palabras de inauguración del curso de sustancia blanca cerebral estarán a cargo del miembro del Comité de Anatomía de Neurocirugía de la Federación Mundial de Sociedades de Neurocirugía, Igor Lima Maldonado. Good morning, everybody. So uh, I'll start speaking in uh, English. I'm sorry. <laughs> this will be uh, for um, so, so that we can um, communicate uh, freely will be the official um, language of this meeting. So first of all, thanks for uh, all the organizing entities, uh, Universidad del Valle, Instituto Neurocirugia de Bolivia, and uh, 
the Bolivian Society of Neurosurgery. So um, it's a very beautiful place, very beautifully organized. Uh, but this uh, committee courses are generally um, very interactive and not that formal courses. So please, uh, I would like to ask you, some of you, we are, we have, we are going to start uh, in some minutes, so I'd like to ask you to occupy the first roles, to interact with us, and just in order to um, acknowledge more or less uh, how you feel with uh, brain white matter, please, how many of you are fully trained in neurosurgeons here? How many of you are residents? Okay. How many of you are medical students? And most of you didn't answer. Okay. So, um, you have here uh, a group of um, committee members, which is representative of a different place, of different continents of the world, which is what has been for ourselves a wonderful experience. Uh, this is not only an educational committee, it's only, uh, also a group of friends. So we are very, you know, um, free, free, pleasant, and you know, uh, free to talk to ourselves, to discuss, to uh, make questions. So let's uh, make this uh, course very interactive, very pleasant. Would like to uh, understand what your needs are and discuss with you about this very interesting topic, which is cerebral what matter. So thanks for coming. Nuevamente agradecemos la presencia de todas nuestras autoridades que están esta mañana con nosotros en esta inauguración del curso de la sustancia blanca cerebral, al vicerrector administrativo financiero, el ingeniero Gonzalo Ruiz Ostre, al vicerrector académico de la Universidad del Valle, el doctor Diego Villegas, a la vicerectora de Interacción Social, la licenciada Magister Sandra Ruiz Ostria, al director académico de la carrera de Medicina, la doctora Georgina Martínez, al presidente de la Sociedad de Neurocirugía de Cochabamba, el doctor Jorge Olmos, al director del Instituto de Neurocirugía de Bolivia, doctor Richard Párraga, al presidente del Comité de Anatomía de Neurocirugía de la Federación Mundial de las Sociedades de Neurocirugía, doctor Vladimir Banes de la República Checa, al miembro del Comité de Anatomía de Neurocirugía de la Federación Mundial de Sociedades de Neurocirugía, doctor Igor Lima. Por supuesto, la más cordial bienvenida a nuestra ciudad y a la Universidad del Valle, a todos los docentes y a todos los doctores que están con nosotros, que van a ser las personas que van a estar disertando a lo largo de estos dos días y van a estar haciendo las demostraciones prácticas de este curso de sustancia blanca cerebral a los representantes del Colegio Médico de Cochabamba, a los médicos, docentes, estudiantes, nuevamente muchísimas gracias por estar esta mañana con nosotros y nuevamente agradecer a todos ustedes por haber confiado en el trabajo de la sociedad para lo que significa este curso de sustancias blancas y revelada. Vamos a despedir, por favor, con un fuerte aplauso a nuestros invitados de la testera. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias a nuestros invitados, a nuestros docentes, a nuestros expositores que están con nosotros, a los directores de las diferentes carreras también y a estudiantes. Vamos a pedir que podamos tener unos cinco minutitos. Tenemos todavía unas palabras más, por favor, entonces vamos a invitar al doctor Benis, por favor, que pueda subir a la testera. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, everything was said by Professor Maldonado, so I have nothing more to add, just we are happy to be here. We thank all the local organizers for allowing us to come. And uh, this is the first time in South America. And I believe that, that we shall be as successful and you will be as satisfied as in the other parts. Uh, let me finish on personal note. Uh, in Cochabamba, there was a neurosurgeon named Piroga, am I right? Or Quiroga. And he was trained in my department in 1960s not by myself, of course. <laughs>
So there is some relation between Czech Republic and uh, Bolivia. Thank you. Nuevamente, muchísimas gracias a nuestra testera que está esta mañana con nosotros en esta inauguración. Queremos recordarles, por favor, que todas las personas pueden acercarse a la cabina que está al fondo para recoger sus intercomunicadores para la traducción simultánea, para que todos podamos estar comunicados y todos podamos estar al tanto de todo lo que se está hablando y por supuesto, de la, todas las exposiciones que se van a desarrollar en breves minutos. Nuevamente, les brindamos un fuerte aplauso. Gracias a ustedes. Un aplauso para todos ustedes. Nuevamente, felicidades a todos los médicos en este día especial. A los estudiantes, por ser el día de la primavera del estudiante también. Muchísimas gracias. Vamos a tener unos cinco minutitos, por favor, para poder mover a la testera, para que ya inmediatamente podamos dar inicio a las exposiciones de la mañana del día de hoy. Muchísimas gracias y muy buenos días. Good morning. So let's begin with the, the boring toast of the, to, talk of the day. You know, I will try to give you a few information about the, the way you can explore the white matter. Uh, it will be divided in three parts. The first one will be dedicated to many history and the, 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 the historical methods that were used to, to study this white matter. Actually, the white matter was the main topic in cerebral anatomy for years, for centuries, I should say. In this picture from, uh, from Vesalius, you see that the, the ventricles are nicely depicted and the phorynx and the corpus callosum are nicely depicted. Nobody cared about the cortex at the time. In fact, it came from the, the fact that uh, the, the main theories, uh, the main kind of physiological theories at the time, put the animal spirit, what was moving The, the body within the ventricle. So it was very important to describe what was around the ventricle, but uh, nobody cared about the cortex. One century later, it, uh, in this talk, uh, Nicolas Tenson, Nicolas Tenon, um, explained that a good method to study the white matter or to study the, the nerves would be to follow the nerves from the periphery up to the parenchyma. But at the time, it was completely impossible. There was no technical uh, method for conserving the brain, for preserving the brain. So he just said, okay, since it is impossible, just call the whole white matter the corpus callosum. A few years later, the anatomists began to try to imagine some, uh, some methods to, to, study the, to study the white matter. And one of the first methods was to boil the specimen. They took the brain, they boiled it, and they di dissected it. And for in, in this picture, Raymond Vieux-Sens um, was uh, able to dissect the centrum of Valley, and he was able to follow the, the fibers of the internal capsule up to the brain stem. So it was a major progress. If we make a big jump in the 19th century, this guy, Theodore Minot, continued to make dissection. He was a psychiatrist at the time, and he described three kinds of uh, white matter uh, tracts, sorry, the association tracts that are located within a given hemisphere, the commercial tracts between both hemispheres, and finally the projection tracts going from the hemispheres up to the subcortical or spinal areas. This was a major advance in the, in the field. If we continue a few years later, you probably know these two people, uh, Jean, uh, Joseph Schul uh, Dejrin and his wife. They were neurologists and neuropathologists. It was the same job at the time. And they spent a long part of their life slicing brains in small, uh, small things. And uh, they were very famous. You see this picture, which is from a, a comic book at the time. And they are displayed as uh, people working in a, in a butchery. And they were cutting, cutting brains for, for, for people. And in fact, they used very advanced methods for the time. And they were able to describe very uh, precisely the brain, including the white matter. The problem for Dejuin was that the dissection for him, in his mind, was not the good solution because it was too complicated to dissect these intermingled fibers. So he was a, a supporter of um, serial slices. We had to wait about three, three decades 
to see this guy, who is uh, Joseph Klingler. He was uh, not an anatomist, he was a technician He's in, uh, in Basel, and he was a uh, kind of a genius in the field. And he, he described the method to uh, dissect the white matter. This is what you will do this afternoon. Basically, the method is very simple. It's still the, the same that we use today. Uh, at the time, he was just extracting the brain and fixing the brain in uh, formalin. Now, we change a little bit the method by injecting formalin within the carotids. And then you have to be patient and to wait for the fixation of the specimens. After this fixation, you split the brain, you remove the PR matter, and you freeze the brain for about eight days at minus 18, minus 20 degrees, <coughs> just for uh, prepare the specimen. And then you infreeze the brain and you can dissect the brain with curettes, forceps, and wood spatula. So it's a very, very, very simple and cheap method. Of course, uh, the way it works was not very clear. In Klingler's mind, he, he imagined, in fact, Klingler's imagined that uh, there were some crystals, some ice crystals that were developing within the fibers, within the white matter, and these Christ crystals were acting as microdissectors that were delacerating the fibers. It was the hypothesis, but it was not completely demonstrated. So uh, in the lab, Elias uh, showed that very nicely using uh, electronic microscopy. And what he showed is that uh, the, the freezing and freezing process creates some spaces between the axon and delacerate the fibers. So, and in the same time, it preserves the, the myelin sheath, meaning that it preserves the whole organization of the uh, white matter. So that method can be used to study the white matter very cheaply. So this is what we, you will do this afternoon. It's a video from uh, Higor. You see that using these very simple instruments, you can just uh, delacerate fibers. When we say fibers, it's uh, tracts, in fact, because uh, you, of course it's not an axon, it's a packets of uh, axons. And you see that you can delacerate them for quite a long uh, route. In fact, everything st stopped for at least 30, century, so 30, 30 years. Nobody took care about the white matter. Nobody was interested in white matter. At the time, everybody was looking at the cortex and nobody cared about the white matter. We had to wait uh, the, the 90s to have these two guys who uh, awake the Sleeping Beauty. Uh, these two guys were um, working in the field of MRI, and they're still working, actually, and they developed a method called the diffusion weighted MRI, which gave us access to the, uh, the anatomy of the white matter in vivo. So does it work? Very, very uh, basically, or does it work? Actually, if you look at the MRI like this, you see that the white matter is quite homogeneous. You cannot see the uh, white matter tracts. It means that you need a new contrast, a new ponderation to show you this white matter tract. And to do so, you can use the diffusion properties of the, of the water within the brain. If you put a drop of ink in a, in a bucket of water, you know that the, the ink will diffuse within the water. There are two situations. If the water is pure, it will diffuse randomly in every direction. That is to say, the diffusion will look like a sphere. But if there is something in the water, for instance fibers, uh, you will see that the diffusion will mainly follow the fibers. So this is the principle of the diffusion-weighted Im imaging. We study the diffusion of the water within the brain, and based on that, we can, uh, we can imagine, we can, uh, in, we can uh, reconstruct the microarchitecture of the brain. So it's a very simple method. How can we do that? There are several steps. The first step is, of course, the acquisition of the, of the signal. I, won't, I will try not to be too boring with that, but just a few ID for you. Uh, if you take, for instance, water of brain or brain or whatever, you put that in the MRI with a, a, magnetic, a magnetic field, and you uh, give energy to that uh, specimen. Then if you stop to give energy, to, to stop the radio frequency, you will get a signal. This signal will be used to reconstruct the images. Okay. If you now put what we call the gradient, this is the blue stuff here, if you put a gradient, this gradient is in fact a linear variation of the magnetic field, 
And this gradient will induce changes in the, the phase of the proton. That is to say, they won't turn exactly at the same speed. The result is that if you stop uh, the radio frequency, then you will have also a signal, but it will, it will have a lower uh, intensity. And this intensity uh, can be compensated by putting a gradient in the reverse direction. If you put the gradient in the reverse direction, then the, the protons will change again their speed and they will become again in phase. And at the end, if you stop uh, the radio frequency, you will get the same signal as the beginning. So you tell me it's completely stupid. You put gradients, you decrease the signal, and then you re-increase the signal by another gradient. So it, there's no change. But in fact, what you can do, what you can observe, is that uh, between both gradients, some of the protons can move, they can diffuse. And you see, for instance, there are protons that diffuse from that row to that uh, row. Same thing here, same thing there. And if the diffusion occurs along the direction of the gradient, when you apply the second one, the rephasing isn't perfect. And finally, there is a decrease, an attenuation of the signal at the end. And the higher the attenuation, the higher the diffusion. So by measuring the attenuation of the signal, you can imagine, you can compute the uh, importance of the amplitude, sorry, of the, of the diffusion. So this was the very, very boring part. Okay, so here, uh, once you have this data, you can compute well, what we call the apparent diffusion coefficient map. This is something, uh, it is an information that you, you use every day when you use MRI. It, it answers the, the question, how much does it diffuse? You have that kind of maps, and here you see when it's, uh, when it's white, when it's bright, it means that there's a high degree of diffusion. This is normal, for instance, in the ventricle it's water, so it diffuses a lot. Whereas in the parenchyma, it's darker, meaning that in the parenchyma, the diffusion is lower, which is normal because there are barriers made by the fibers and the neurons. You know, of course, that it is used, for instance, to diagnose the ischemic stroke in the, in the initial, uh, initial stage, because when you have a stroke, there is a edema, and since there is edema, there are low, less, uh, less, less water between the cells, and since there is less water, the diffusion decreases, and it becomes dark in these ADC maps. But no, on that map, you know that it diffuses or not, but you don't know how it diffuses. So you can use another uh, method to try to model the diffusion. The goal is to construct, to build a model, a mathematical model for each voxel, uh, explaining the, the, the main direction of diffusion within this voxel. The easiest way is to use that diffusion tensor imaging. That is to say, you will just model the diffusion for each voxel, each element of the image. You will try to imagine what is the shape of the, the diffusion. And you will model the diffusion as an ellipsoid, like this, uh, which is very simple mathematically to, to handle. Once you have that, you can compute the fractional anisotropy. The fractional anisotropy gives you information about the, um, uh, the, the, the way the, the brain is organized. For instance, if you look within the ventricles in water, as I told you, the diffusion was, doing, well, was uh, random. It was doing like a sphere. It is what is uh, schematically drawn here. And when the it looks like a sphere. It is called isotropic because it goes in the, about the same in the, every direction. In this case, the fractional isotropy is close to zero. If you look in the corpus callosum, the situation is very different. You have very densely packed axons, and this densely packed axon will oblige the water to diffuse along the, uh, along the, the fibers, meaning that here it will be highly, highly anisotropic, the direction will be preferentially the direction of the fibers, and the FA will uh, tend towards one. But of course here you know that uh, there is a preferential diffusion, di diffusion direction, but you don't know what it is. So you can have that kind of maps in, oops, sorry, you can have that kind of maps in which the color encodes the direction. That is to say when it's red here, it means the diffusion is mainly going from right to left or left to right. 
When it's blue, it's going from the feet to the head or from the head to the feet. And when it's uh, green, it goes from anterior to posterior, posterior to anterior. So it gives you information about the direction of the diffusion. So you see that every map gives you different information. But in fact, this diffusion tension imaging model is very, very, very simple. Because of course, you say, OK, we have a voxel. And in the voxel, you consider only one direction of diffusion, which is not the case. Because of course, you know that there are many, many uh, fibers in one voxel. So of course, you cannot have only one direction of diffusion. But it's a very simplistic way to uh, understand these, uh, this problem. But of course, by doing so, you lose a lot of information. And sometimes people want to have more information. And you can develop some uh, more complicated models in which the diffusion is not modeled by an ellipsoid, by, but by a more, more complex figure, as you can see here, where in each voxel, you can have several directions of diffusion. So that's very interesting, because with the previous models, since there was only one direction of diffusion, you were not able to study the crossing of the fibers. Here, you can study the crossing of the fibers. For instance, here you have different population of fibers that are crossing in the same voxel. So it's a more complicated model, but of course, it costs a lot of time. When you do that, you need uh, more and more time. And by doing so, doing so is a bit complicated in, uh, in uh, clinical practice. Once you acquire the data, you model the data, and then you can do the tractography, which is the most spectacular. But before doing the tractography, you have to do all these steps. So the tractography tries to answer the, the question, what are the fiber roots? So we will try to build mathematical models of the fiber roots. There are two big methods. Some are called the local methods, and some are called the global methods. I will mainly insist on the local method, because they are way simple to understand. Uh, let's imagine you have an image. Each square on the image corresponds to a voxel. And on the previous step, you computed the main direction of diffusion. So you see that, for instance, here you have this direction, then that direction. Yes, you can see the, the fibers. So usually, you just consider the main direction of the, of the voxel. Then you choose one of the voxels, and you put what we call a seed at the middle of the voxel. And in this voxel, you will see that the, we will build mathematically a route that will follow the direction, that we will have to another voxel, we will take the direction of that voxel. Then here, we'll take the direction of that one, and, and we will continue voxel by voxel. So it means that at every step, you just look at the very, uh, very neighbors of, the, of the, the voxel you are studying. Meaning that if you have an error somewhere, you will have big, big errors at the end, because if you have a small degree of error at each step, you will have a large error at the end. And of course, you stop the reconstruction when, for instance, the fractional anisotropy, you know, the, the, the parameter that gives you the ID of the, the way it diffuses. When the fractional anisotropy becomes too low, it means that there are no more fibers and it will stop. But it can also mean that they are crossing fibers. Let's imagine you have a population of fiber like this, a population of fiber like that. In one voxel, if they cross, the fractional azinotropy will decrease because they will compensate. It will be, um, it will be a mean of both, uh, both tracts. So it's a problem. It also stops when there are no anatomical angles. For instance, here you see that there's a, a right angle. and. We usually consider that it doesn't exist in nature, so we stop. The, you can fix this alpha parameter, and we can stop the tractography. But of course, it can be a problem. For instance, in Myers loop, you will see that in the afternoon or tomorrow, I don't remember. You will see that the, the fibers in the temporal lobe they make a, of the, the optic radiation they make a U-turn. Of course, if the, the parameter is too strict, you will sh you will uh, you will miss all these fibers. I won't go here. Just to tell you that sometimes you can put several seeds in one voxel, meaning that at the end you will have more fibers. What I want to stress is that the number of fibers you see on the screen they are not, is not the, the real number of fibers. It's just a mathematical representation of diffusion paths. You don't see the fibers, you see diffusion paths. So you have to be very, very careful with that. 
Then you can have deterministic or probabilistic uh, methods. In deterministic, it's very strict, you know. You just have one direction. This is the one I showed you previously. One direction, and then uh, you change the voxel, you change the direction, but there's only one direction. And of course, as I told you, if there are some errors, it will accumulate. But you can also had a certain degree of uncertainty, that is to say, at each step, you admit that there are several possible routes. That's good because it, uh, it will compensate for the errors that will accumulate for each of the steps. These probabilistic uh, methods are very interesting, but they also cost a lot of, uh, a lot of time. I won't give you too much detail about the global method, just for you to know that instead of looking only what's going on around one given voxel, you will look at the whole brain and you will try to find the best solution for the whole brain, not only for one voxel, but for the whole brain at the same time. So it will be, be very compute, computationally uh, intensive, but the, the results are quite interesting. This is, for instance, a global tractography that we obtained from one of our specimens. It was done by our colleagues from uh, CEVA in, uh, in Paris. And um, you see here that the fibers are going up to the cortex, whereas usually there are no, no tracks in the cortex, only because the isotropy is decreasing. But with that method, when you also inject some uh, anatomical constraint, you can go up to the cortex. OK, so I showed you nice images. But are those images real or not? This is the main question. Because I told you that what you see, in fact, is not, uh, is not uh, uh, really the, the fibers. You don't see the fibers. You see a representation of the fibers that corresponds to main uh, diffusion paths. So you have to keep that in mind. What you see, when you look at the screen, you don't see the fibers, you see diffusion. So it's very different. You can have many, many artifacts. You, we use, as, you, you showed, as I showed you, you, we use several mathematical models that makes uh, the, the our life simpler, but that goes away from the reality. And the big concern is that when you look, you take a set of data, you use several methods to study this set of data, and then you get different results. So there's a problem somewhere. There are two papers interesting. That one, published by Pujol, she um, took four clinical data sets from uh, people who are suffering from a brain tumor, and she asked a nine, eight sorry, independent neurosurgical team to reconstruct the pyramidal tract, which is quite easy. And they were asked to reconstruct Ipsi and control laterally. And then she got these results. So same data, but different results from different teams. And she compared the different results. And of course, you can see that there are many, many differences, Ipsi and contralateral to the tumor. So it's, a, it's really a problem, because how can you use that kind of data for navigating, for instance, in the operating room? That's, that's a problem. Another paper gave the same results. It was uh, published last year. Uh, they, they use about the same method. They, they, they use the same data set with different, different teams and different methods, and you see that there are many variations between the different methods. So what they show is that most of the bundles were detected, but there are a lot of false positive in that, uh, that uh, method. So how can you trust that, and what, sh what should we trust? So there is a need for validation. Several methods were developed for validation. I won't insist for on all of the, these methods. I will just insist on the ones that are uh, usable in humans, so that is to say the ones that, that don't need any injection in vivo. For instance, you can use uh, ex vivo tractography. You can take a post-mortem specimen, put that on a MRI, and you can scan for days, for weeks, uh, without any problem, because the specimen doesn't complain, of course, and you don't have any physiological noise, there is no respiration, no change in temperature, so it's perfect, per perfect conditions. The problem is that after death, there's a rapid drop of diffusion, and uh, so you have to, to use uh, technical tricks to uh, improve the um, the situation. The, the, the small video on the right corresponds to uh, images that we obtained in the lab. Uh, it was scanned actually in Neurospin in Paris, and uh, it's a brain stem that we extracted in the lab. And what you see here are the different uh, nuclei of the brain stem, and you also see that we had some, uh, some tracts using that uh, ex vivo tractography method. 
So of course it's very nice, but uh, I'm not sure it's a very good tool for validating in vivo tractography because it's also, it's also tractography. So can you validate tractography by tractography? <coughs> I don't think it's a good idea. Another method is the, um, the PLI, the polarized light imaging. It's a method we don't use in the lab, but it's a, it's a very nice method. You take a specimen, it's a slice of brain, and you illuminate the, the, the brain, the, the slice, with a polarized uh, light, with a direction of illumination. This is important because the myeline uh, has also directions, it makes the fibers, and depending on the relative direction of the light and the myeline, you will get more or less, image, uh, more or less light transmission. And from that, you can reconstruct that kind of very nice images. Uh, the problem is that uh, you can, of course, with that you can obtain micrometric resolution. You, you obtain a huge amount of data, terabytes of data. The problem is to know what to do with that afterwards. Because <coughs> you have too, too many data, data to, to process them. Another problem is that you have to make slices, and when you make slices of the brain, you will distort a little bit the brain, so of course it will be complicated to get a wall ID. It's very nice on the slice, but it will be complicated to get a wall ID for the uh, total brain. OCT is another method. It's about the same. You look at the, but you, instead of looking at slices, you're looking at the surface of the of the brain. The ophthalmologists know that very well. They do. They use that to look at the retina, and in fact, it's a kind of a 3D reconstruction of the surface of the specimen. So you scan the specimen, then you uh, you remove a little bit of the surface of the specimen. You rescan, and by doing so, you can reconstruct the direction of the tract. But it's really time consuming. And it's very difficult to perform on large samples. Finally, a good solution that we use in the lab is the Klingler's method. I showed you that this method was reliable to study the white matter. Uh, the problem is that, for instance, when you, there are several problems, but for instance, when you perform a dissection, as you will do to this afternoon, you will be destructive. You will remove part of the specimen during the progression of the dissection. So that's a big problem because, of course, it will be very difficult to tell the relative uh, positions of two white matter tracts within the brain. So we developed a method called FibraScan uh, in the lab. It's very simple. In fact, you, you take the brain, you put the brain on a special holder, you perform an ex vivo MRI just to have a reference space, and then you use a device I will show you to uh, acquire the surface, the surface of the, um, the specimen using this uh, laser surface scanner that gives you a surface of the specimen. So you have the surface of the specimen, you project a picture, a, pho a photograph of the same specimen, and then you can manually tell, you can manually segment the interesting part of the specimen, telling that, for instance, the blue part corresponds to um, the arcuate fasciculus. You do that for, for at each step of dissection, because you will see that in Klingler's dissection, it will be a step-by-step -step process. You have to go very slowly, otherwise you will destroy everything. So at every step, you get a small segment of the arcuate fasciculus, and you can pile up all these segments and project that within the uh, anatomical space of the MRI. So at the end, you have uh, here, this is a ex vivo MRI of the specimen, and what is in red is the arcuate fasciculus, but this is not tractography, this is from anatomy, from dissection. We are using these uh, for um, a protocol we are running in the lab, in which uh, we ask people who donate their body to science to perform an in vivo MRI. We have about, in the lab, we have about 220 uh, bodies per year that arrive from body donation. Uh, so we ask people that are more than 82 years old to come uh, to have a MRI. Then we wait them to die. And when we, they are die, we extract the brain and we perform an ex vivo MRI, just to have the, this data. And we begin the dissection process that I showed you using the FibraScan method. So at the end, it means that we will have in vivo MRI, ex vivo MRI, and dissection, and we will be able to compare these three sources of data to tell <coughs> if uh, ex vivo and in vivo MRI are reliable or not. 
So this is the, the important uh, messages. I, I hope you are convinced that the Klingler's method is a reliable method. Uh, the other point is that tractography gives you very, very, very nice images, but be careful with those images. You, um, you have to keep in mind that what you see here are not fibers, it's ju just preferential uh, paths for the diffusion of the water molecule. And of course, this method has to be validated. Without validation, you shouldn't trust those pretty images. Thank you very much. Any questions? I hope you didn't f fall asleep. Do you want the... No questions? A continuación vamos a tener la exposición del doctor Igor Lima Maldonado, él es coordinador del servicio de neurocirugía y jefe de la unidad de neuromusculoesquelética del complejo hospitalario profesor Edgar Santos, profesor adjunto e investigador de la Universidad Federal de Bahía, miembro del Comité de Anatomía Neuroquirúrgica de la Federación Mundial de Sociedades de Neurocirugía del Brasil. El tema que se va a desarrollar a continuación es la organización general de la sustancia blanca hemisferio. Eh, recibamos por favor con un fuerte aplauso al doctor Igor Lima Maldonado, que a continuación va a proceder con lo que significa la exposición del día de hoy. Nuevamente, por favor, para algunas de las personas, recordarles que eh, pueden pasar por donde está la cabina del fondo para poder recoger sus intercomunicadores para poder tener la traducción simultánea. Muchísimas gracias. Nuevamente le brindamos un fuerte aplauso, por favor, al doctor Igor Lima Maldonado. So, thank you, thank you for this kind of presentation. So, we're going to uh, go now straight forward to some uh, morphology. Uh, most of what I'm, I'm going to show you is uh, from uh, fiber dissection results. There was some tractography, but not much. So um, this is a nice example. I like this specimen uh, of a, a specimen that was prepared for fiber dissection using the Klingus technique. So just as Professor Destre showed you. So um, we can recognize here, for example, um, the men uh, sulci and gyri. Of course, you see here lateral sulcos central sulcos, and then frontal lobes, superior, middle, and inferior uh, gyros with the orbital uh, triangular and opercular portions, precentral gyros, postcentral gyros, supramarginal, angular, and temporal lobe with the superior, middle, and inferior. So uh, well, something interesting to notice in this specimen is that after preparation, the color changes a little. It's quite brownish. And it's also interesting to see how the gray matter becomes fragile and may be removed very easily. But the uh, white matter you see in the next slide keeps uh, itself very firm, so uh, we can, for example, remove the cortex and keep the uh, subcortical bundles uh, very, um, very easily. So. Uh, we can do the same kind of procedure I'll show uh, in some minutes for the insula, for example. We could recognize here the apex of the insula, the limited sulcos of the insula, superior and inferior limited sulcos, uh, the limen, the short and long gyri, and uh, uh, also we can, for example, um, get into this region and see uh, the different capsules, for example, extreme capsule, external capsules, and look at all those fibers. So I will skip this, it's only uh, for uh, general uh, cortical anatomy, but it's really important to keep that in mind for two reasons. One is this, cortical uh, gyro anatomy and sulcal anatomy is really important because it's like our um, roadmap for um, functional areas of the brain. But be very careful when you, when you think about functional areas of the brain, because I'm, 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 I don't have the goal here to uh, tell you a phrenological story 
uh, many of these areas uh, for, for example, high functions and language may vary a lot from an individual from, uh, to the other. And of course, if you have those cortical organs, cortical regions that are well preserved, but you cut the connectivity, the cables that are leaking then, they are useless. And the other reason is that when you progress in your dissection, as Professor Destrio said, you will destroy the last step you made in your dissection. So it's extremely important to keep in mind the cortical anatomy, the cortical morphology as a roadmap, so you don't get lost when you see the white matter tracts behind it. So what I'm um, going to show you is uh, some basi basic uh, concepts about how we recognize uh, the main bundles inside of this homophos, very homogeneous white matter here would be, we also serve as an introduction for detailed lectures that we'll have in some minutes. So um, why is that difficult? Because in many parts, the white matter is just homogeneous and amorphous. Even though you know there are lots of different things inside, you don't see very well and the fresh specimen in neurosurgery, for example. But sometimes you have alternation of gray matter and white matter, so some parts of the white matter may be well delimited and uh, drawn, depicted by the gray matter, but that's often not the case. That's not the case with fresh specimen, with very uh, traditional fixation techniques, and also with the traditional imaging techniques. Even though we know that the white matter contains a lot of fibers and those fibers are agglomerates of axons, we don't see them. And uh, as Professor Desiree said, you, I don't, I'm not uh, getting my time with that, uh, different researchers try to solve this problem, but a special method we are going to use uh, this afternoon for those that are going to perform the session is the Klinger's method. And so uh, the uh, pictures I'm going to show you were prepared with this method which includes fixation and a uh, step of con congelation. So what I'm going to show is uh, different steps. We're going from the lateral, superlateral aspect of the cerebral hemisphere up to uh, the medial aspect, seeing uh, how those uh, elements or the, those components of the white matter are disposed in this space. Uh, we already saw this. Uh, as long as you see these uh, elements, try to understand, uh, recognize if you were dealing with uh, uh, one of those three groups of fibers, if we're dealing with the commissural fibers that are linking hemispheres, if you were dealing with projector fibers, were linking uh, regions with, uh, with the different levels of integration, or if you are linking with association fibers, which are linking different regions of the semi cerebral hemisphere. And those, this is a resume of some of the uh, main fasciculi that we're going to see today. So uh, we'll talk a lot about the superior uh, longitudinal fasciculus complex. Why they say complex? Because nowadays we recognize that it is not only a, fascicule, a fasciculus, but a complex made of different subcomponents. We'll talk a lot about uh, this one, which is the inferior frontal occipital fasciculus, extremely important, for example, for glioma surgery. It has been associated with uh, language functions. Uh, mainly in the dominant hemisphere, but it's a, a lot of discussion about this concept of dominant hemisphere. Uh, we'll talk a lot about the inferior longitudinal fasciculus, the insulinate fasciculus, a little bit about the uh, frontal island tract. So this is the same hemisphere. I like this one a lot because it reproduces a lot of, of the anatomy that we studied at medical school and anatomy that we would like to see in every brain. But as you know, there is a lot of variation. So when you remove the gray matter, as I told you, the first thing we notice is that we don't dive directly in the, in the white matter of those fasciculi, because before we have a subcortical layer of a firm white matter. And this subcortical layer is quite um, soft, brilliant, smooth, at the level of the depth of the soul sky, but it's quite rough at the level of the top of the gyri. 
So why is that? If we zoom this image, we see the main reason is the fact that all so-called, so every so-called, is covered by a huge number of this short U association fibers. I mean, association fibers that are linking different uh, gyri uh, one to each other. So these fibers have been received several names, uh, short association fibers, U fibers, subcortical fibers, intragyral fibers, but they are um, getting, in, um, they are finishing, terminating mostly at the level of the, uh, many, many of them, at the level of the, um, of the topia of the gyro would leave this aspect when we remove the white matter. So this is something that we're going to do in the lab. Uh, in order to penetrate the semoval center and to see those big fasciculi, you have to remove them. And when we remove them, we see some horizontal oriented fibers which are more long. So we know that you are in the lateral part of that big associative complex with the superior longitudinal fasciculus complex. And this complex has been updated a lot uh, recently. These are some works on um, diffusion tensor imaging and uh, autoradiography in monkeys, uh, which is a very good example how this complex is a complex. Uh, it's now recognized that you have uh, in the horizontal portion of the fasciculus of the complex different, uh, different um, segments uh, that have been numerated as SLF1, SLF2, and SLF3. They are more or less at the level of the superior, middle, and inferior frontal gyrus. SLF1 has been called the dorsal component, SLF2 the major component, and SLF3 the ventral or opercular component of the horizontal part of the superior longitudinal fasciculus. And of course, you have the arcuate fasciculus not completely represented here. And even though there are some uh, shorter fibers that may uh, not uh, run uh, the whole length of the fasciculi, but they may, for example, uh, connect the parietal to the temporal lobe, which is, has been recognized as the posterior uh, segment of the complex. So we're going to see all that in detail. This is an example. So you have this uh, uh, specimen being prepared, being dissected with the Klinger technique. It's a posterior inferior view. So we see here the lateral socles. This is superior temporal socles. So this is, or this was, the superior uh, the uh, supermarginal gyrus. So what are you seeing here are fibers that are vertically oriented connecting the posterior superior portion of the temporal lobe with the supramarginal gyrus. So those fibers are part of the posterior segment of the superior longitudinal fasciculus complex. Another angle of view, this is a super lateral view. Same thing, you see here the uh, lateral sulcals, Sylvian Fisher, and this is the frontal parietal operculum, and you see those oriental fibers. So we are getting into the um, superior longitudinal fasciculus complex in the semovel center. But let's uh, get deeper to that. Let's cut a little bit the opercula. And what we see here, in the deep portions, we have a very long fibers that we can follow then and dissect, as you saw in the video. And those long fibers are going from the frontal lobe to the temporal lobe and vice versa. You can imagine that here we would have, for example, the orbital portion, the uh, triangular portion of the inferior frontal gyrus. So this is a, the very famous uh, arcuate fasciculus, which has been classically implicated in, the, um, in language processing. And uh, I may warn you, there is a quite of confusion in uh, old literature because the term arcuate fasciculus has been a lot used as a synonymous of a superior longitudinal fasciculus. But as I told you, you know, it has to be a little bit careful when we are talking about subcomponents of the complex. So this is another example, but it's a different dissection. We're not isolating those fibers which are around the opercula around the limit and sulcus of the insula that will project more, more or less here. We are forgetting that and we're concentrated on fibers that are in the uh, semoval center. So this is what we call the major component of SLF2, uh, connecting the frontal lobe to the parietal lobe. So once again, you have the same representation here. So that's what we said, we saw this complex with 
its different subcomponents. So uh, I showed you all the components except the SLF1, which is the most dorsal one, would be run this region along the superior border of the hemisphere. I'm not go going into the details, but when you dissect that with Kingler's technique, what you see mostly in human beings is a succession of a, a regional association fibers. Don't expect it in your dissection to find a dorsal component very long coming from here for here to here. There's a huge discussion about that. Um, we can discuss it later. But we he really have the impression that when you see that in tractography, uh, you have the impression that it's a big horizontal, very long, very huge uh, dorsal portion of the SLF complex, but it's not exactly what you see in Klinger's dissection. So for the insula, let's apply the same principle. Let's remove the cortex. And when we remove the cortex, before you get into the basal ganglia, first thing you see is this not very fibrous, quite amorphous um, layer of white matter. And what's that? We are used to study that in cuts, in slice. But here we have a more three-dimensional imaging of this, not imaging, but ID of this. This is the external extreme capsula, right? And when you look at the extreme capsula, I'm sorry, when you work at the extreme capsula and you start to remove it, we see that deeper to that, you have some, some very um, identifiable fibers that start to appear. And between those two layers, you have some islands of gray matter. So what's happening here? I'm getting into the deepness uh, of, the, of the parenchyma, deepness of the insula. And when we remove the uh, extreme capsula, we started to see clostrum. But clostrum is very thin, so most of, of the clostrum has been removed here with the extreme capsula. And those fibers are fibers that belong to external capsula. So you have to keep in mind that your insula was here. So this corresponds to the limen of the insula. And if I see you, I say to you that this is a vessel, which one would be? It's the middle cerebral artery. So the insula was here, this is frontal lobe, this is temporal lobe. And so this is thing connecting the frontal lobe to the temporal lobe is the arcuate fasciculus. And here is the frontal occipital, inferior frontal occipital fasciculus that I showed in the beginning. So you recognize that at the level of the external capsula, you have two very different identifiable regions. One that is um, if anterior inferior, when you see those long associated fasciculi with very uh, defined ones, and you have a superior posterior region wh where you see mostly centrifugal fibers that are coming from the clostrum and from the lateral aspect of this basal nucleus, which is the putamen, which is deep to the uh, external capsula. So let's keep it going. This is just another specimen. This is anterior, this is posterior. Uh, so once again, frontal lobe, temporal lobe, insulinate fasciculi, I4 or inferior frontal occipital fasciculus will be here, some centrifugal fibers, and lateral aspect of the putamen. And this is a very interesting view, because if you try to keep in mind the first steps, the arcuate fasciculus would, would be here. So it was cut. And if it is the... Um, a lenticular nucleus, I mean, this is part of it, this is lateral aspect of the putamen. Uh, medial to that, I have the internal capsula, right? And so what I'm seeing here are fibers of the internal capsula that is going up and becoming the corona radiata. So external capsula and the internal capsula get together, as you see here, and form the corona radiata. Another example, just the IFOF that is isolated. So I will skip that. So this is a general view. This is the left hemisphere, this is anterior, this is posterior. So frontal lobe, temporal lobe, this is oncinate fasciculus. This is inferior frontal occipital fasciculus. This is lateral aspect of the putamen. External capsula, corona radiata. And what is this remnant? In this dissection, part of the arcuate fasciculus was preserved so we can have a general idea of the relationships of those components. And what would be here, this here, at the inferior border of the dissection? This is uh, the inferior longitudinal fasciculus. So just uh, a small comment on this uh, relations, 
uh, shape of the, uh, the anatomical structures. For example, uh, if you try to remember, your insula was here, right? So your circular circles of the insula will be here. So um, you see there is a little bit bulging here. You know what this bulging is about? Um, let's try to think this way. If I would um, puncture a ventricle here, for example, would I, where would I put my needle? Here, here, or here? A, B, or C? So these are the kind of anatomical relationship I'm trying to understand, because this bulging here corresponds mostly of fibers of the corpus callosum that, that are coming from the other side and always spreading up and down. And this, if this bulges correspond to the corpus callosum, it means that most of the ventricle will be here, because the core trunk of the corpus callosum form the roof of the ventricle, right? So if I want to puncture the ventricle, I would tend to try it here, not here, and not there. So it's just this kind of a, um, reasoning which is extremely useful uh, when we talk about a fiber dissection, because uh, when you're doing a Klinger's technique, technique, it's a lot about imagining what you have behind this structure. You're not seeing it yet, but you are understanding how things are organized. So, uh, this is another interring reflection. Uh, you see all the corona radiata around the uh, lenticular nuclei here, and here, and you have this region, which is just middle to the arcuate fasciculus. We have a lot of horizontally oriented fibers, a lot of uh, layers here. It's called the sagittal striton. So, the IFOF is a, a big fasciculus which uh, passing through the, uh, along the sagittal stratum. So what you see in this dissection is uh, IFOF diving into deep portions of the temporal lobe and the insula and get to the frontal lobe. So in order to perform this dissection, a big part of the temporal lobe was removed here, right? So something that we may think is that all fibers of the uh, strat sagittal stratum are doing this, or di diving into the temporal lobe and get to the insula. That's not completely true. Uh, it's not quite easy to dissect, but if you follow those superficial fibers very easily, you see that some of them get actually to the uh, temporal or operculum, and not all of them diving. So it's uh, very, uh, at this moment, we understand very easily uh, that these fibers, for example, do not belong to the IFOF. This is what is being called the middle longitudinal fasciculus. Uh, let me get deep, a little bit deeper uh, at the level of the um, size to stratum. This is a lateral view, very deep dissection. So we recognize here the uh, brainstem, right? Uh, the mesencephalon. So these are colliculi. So this is posterior, this is anterior. This is the chiasma and optitract and uh, lateral geniculated body. So whatever we're seeing here is the same region, it's just a deeper layer. We are seeing optiradiations that are leaving the lateral geniculated body to uh, reach the occipital lobe. And something that is really interesting is that even though some fibers arch a little bit and go to the uh, uh, lips of the calcarine fissure, very straightforward. Some one temporal ones go anteriorly and then they develop a small uh, loop and then go um, posterior. So that's what mentioned by uh, Professor Desria, what's called the temporal loop of the Meyer, My, uh, Myers loop, which we see very well in this um, inferior view. Once again, this is anterior, this is posterior, this is calcarine fissure, right? So these are the lips of the calcarine fissure, which is the site of the primary, of the primary visual cortex. So this is optic tract, lateral geniculated body. So you see that some fibers go straight forward there, some fibers develop the Meyer loop before going to the calcarine cortex. I will skip that. Uh, there are some, I'm almost to finish, some pictures to show the relationship of these different uh, things, how we can put them together. This is an inter interesting view, for example. It's a superior view of deep, deep dissection. We recognize here the corpus callosum. And don't be astonished if I tell you, for example, that this part of the white matter, these fibers here, are um, 
or be belong to the corpus callosum too. We are easy, uh, used to um, imagine the corpus callosum as this um, sagittal cut that you see in MRI, for example, and we see, oh, this is the rostrum, this is the genou, this is the trunk, this is the splenion. But if you want to have a good idea of the corpus callosum, try to keep in mind that this is the biggest uh, commissural component of the cerebral white matter that is connecting uh, the both uh, cerebral hemisphere. I have a, um, a friend of, from Sao Paulo sitting there, Dr. Rafael, and we both know, uh, have a common friend which works in Sao Paulo too, Dr. Ribas, that has a very good analogy. If you want to think about a real representation of corpus callosum, think about a butterfly. And the body of the butterfly is that you see is what you see on MRI when you do such a cut. But it's not, that's not the corpus callosum. If you want to imagine the corpus callosum, imagine the butterfly moving its, uh, for the word, wings. So you have fibers going everywhere. I'm not going to detail this. We have classes for that. Um, this is a medial aspect. So medial aspect, this is a quite superficial dissection putting in evidence some components that for sure you studied for since medical school, which are the components of the limbic system and the circuit of Papes. But many times we don't have the real uh, idea of how those components look like. We use it to study, uh, for example, a limbic system with boxes and arrows and this thing connected to this thing. So this dissection, for example, gives a good idea what the arrows correspond to. So if you have here the temporal lobe and the uh, amygdala and hippocampus, you see the fornix turning around. This is uh, thalamus. This is the roof of the uh, lateral ventricle. So you see very nicely the vent, which is between the thalamus and the fornix, which corresponds to the interventricular foramen of Moro. And then many times you have a most of the time, you have some fibers of the fornix get go anterior to the, uh, to the anterior commissure over here, but most, most fibers go down, penetrate the hypothalamus, and reach the uh, mammillary body. And then you have the uh, uh, mammillothalamic tract, which is being dissected here inside the hypothalamus, and uh, some fibers from the uh, anterior thalamic nuclear spread to singulate areas through the medial aspect of the corona radiata, so they are thalamic radiations. Uh, this is quite a complex anatomy, but it's a really interesting uh, way to see how these different areas are connected in this closed circuit. Uh, we see it very nicely here, the cingulon, which is not uh, something that we we'll not uh, always have in mind. See it's another dissection, no, same thing. You see here, fornix turn around. Uh, mammillary body, uh, mammillothalamic tract, anterior thalamus, uh, thalamic radiation, cingulate uh, fasciculus. So, uh, just to finish, I think I have uh, still some, uh, I have four minutes. Uh, let's go back to the insula. This is a very interesting, um, interesting uh, uh, insight about the uh, this three-dimensional organization. So, of course, it is a right hemisphere. This is anterior. This is posterior. So, uh, this is quite a deep dissection already. So, the extreme extremal capsula was removed. We see here uh, IFOF and uh, uncinate. We also may discuss that those two fascicles they are so uh, thick that they participate also to the uh, to the extremal capsula, not only the external capsula. You see some gray matter here, which belongs to the clostrum. And what I'm going to do here is remove layer per layer, per layer and see what happens. So things, first thing we see, lateral aspect of the putamen. And then we start diving into the putamen. And we see in a given moment that there is still gray matter there. But the gray matter is different. The consistency is different, is more firm, and it's quite pale, whitish. So what's happening? I'm leaving the putamen and I'm getting into the pallidon, the lateral uh, pallidon, uh, GPA. So if you keep doing this and take all this 
gray uh, matter out, you see that the level of the internal capsule, you have the imprint of the different portions of the lenticular nucle nuclei. So putamen was there, lateral pallidum was there, and medial pallidum was here. And of course, part of the lenticular uh, nucleus was left here, but we can take it out and have the internal capsule completely naked. And this is very interesting because we are used to see this in slices, in cuts, in MRIs and CT scans, for example, but we do not always realize that the uh, internal capsule is kind of, a, kind of a shell that is prepared to receive the lenticular nucleus, right? So just I'm doing it with my hand here, I have a shell and my lenticular nucleus was just like this. And we are also used to study the um, internal uh, capsule, talking about the different regions, right? Anterior limb, posterior limb, genu, and we see this very nicely here. The uh, anterior limb of the internal capsule contains fibers that are oriented obliquely, anteriorly obliquely. The genu contain more or less vertical fibers, and the posterior limb contain fibers that are obliquely posteriorly. So you have anterior, genu, and posterior limb. And you see that because of this uh, disposition of a shell of the internal capsule and the uh, lenticular nucleus was just here, you understand better why you have other portions of the uh, internal um, capsule more than those three. You have also a retro lenticular portion of the internal capsule. It means that you have internal capsule behind the lenticular nucleus and you also have a, a sublenticular portion of the internal capsule. And it uh, contains, among other things, the uh, Mayer's loop. So once again, this is uh, anterior commissure and optic tract. So this is only topographic anatomy, let's see the way. You remember when I asked you the question where I would puncture the ventricle? Would not be here. I would never reach the ventricle here. I will reach the folks. If I puncture here, I will be at the roof, at the level of the roof of the ventricle. But if I puncture here, I can reach the anterior horn of the ventricle. So it's quite logical because you remember when I, um, I told you that uh, I have my ventricular nucleus here, I have my uh, RQ8 fascicular there around the circular circles of the insula, limited, limited sul sulci. Uh, you know, if I imagine the, hem the entire um, hemisphere, this region would be covered by the frontal operculum, right? And the frontal operculum corresponds to the level of the anterior horn. So there's a lot of topographic uh, relations. So it's a the same as summary again, I'm not going to repeat it. So this is just to we keep in mind the relationship among the structures. Now we will have other lectures that will detail each of one. So let's just say everything again very quickly. So we see here corporal callosus with the uh, callosal radiations going everywhere. Uh, I had here the lenticular nucleus, which was uh, removed, so I see the imprints of the putamen, of the lateral and medial uh, globus pallidus. Uh, I see some gray matter that was left, so I can preserve uh, this region where you see the IFOF and the ancinate. Around all that, I have uh, the um, arcuate fasciculus, which more or less closed to the circular uh, sulcus of the insula, so the insula was there. Uh, where we have at the other side, we have uh, I told you the corporal callosa and just under it the uh, anterior horn and the ventricle and form a part of the lateral wall of the anterior, big part of the lateral wall of the anterior horn of the ventricle. We have gray matter again. What is this? It's also one of the nuclei. It's the uh, caudate nucleus, right? So let's try to, meet, to keep in mind this skeleton when we will be dissecting in the lab and looking at the MRIs and, of course, trying to apply this for intraparenchymal surgery. So that's what I, I wanted to show. I think uh, I'm in time. I'm okay if you want to, if you have questions. And, you know, uh, Professor Desperio was telling about um, the shift we're living, right? Because during years we were so focusing on white matter, gray matter, gray matter, and knowing and learning all the names of the gyri very precisely, so, but the white matter was there since 
since, since uh, you know, the beginning. So let's try to think a little bit more about the right matter and maybe in some times we'll transform things and this kind of representation will become this one in our heads. <laughs> Thank you very much. Questions? I'm sorry if I did it that too quickly, you know, there's a lot of information. <laughs> questions, questions? Hay alguna pregunta para nuestro expositor? So the next lecture is a morphology and function of the SLF complex in front of was lens tract. So, uh, Professor Pablo González López from Spain. Bueno, muchísimas gracias. Agradecemos al doctor Igor Lima Maldonado. Le va, lo vamos a despedir con un fuerte aplauso, por favor. Muchísimas gracias por la exposición de esta mañana. A continuación, vamos a tener la exposición del doctor Pablo González López. Él es neurocirujano del Hospital IMED de Alicante, España, miembro del Comité de Anatomía de Neuroquirúrgica de la Federación Mundial de Sociedades de Neurocirugía de España. El tema que se va a desarrollar es morfología y función del complejo del fascículo longitudinal superior. Recibamos, por favor, con un fuerte aplauso al doctor Pablo González López. Bueno, buenos días. Permitidme que os agradezca en, en castellano eh, por la invitación para estar aquí con todos vosotros, en especial a, a, a Igor por su invitación, a la organización, a la Universidad del Valle, a todos vosotros por venir sobre todo y en especial a Richard Párraga porque, eh, bueno, cuando yo era un residente muy joven de neurocirugía eh, tuve la suerte de coincidir con él en el laboratorio de, de anatomía en Sao Paulo y gracias a él pues eh, me siento muy orgulloso de decir que, que he entendido toda esta esta historia que os estamos contando acerca de la fibra blanca. Y bueno, mi propósito en esta, en esta charla es enseñaros cómo eh, lo que estamos haciendo aquí en, en, en el laboratorio y lo que vamos a hacer esta tarde puede ayudarnos a comprender esas complejas relaciones que existen en la anatomía eh, subcortical y sobre todo cómo eso puede ayudarnos a ofrecer un mejor tratamiento quirúrgico a nuestros pacientes. Lo dicho, muchas gracias a todos y vamos a ver si, si podéis disfrutarla. Y ahora me paso al inglés, ¿de acuerdo? Bueno, so as I have, this, the, I have just told, uh, um, the idea of this, of this uh, talk is just to show you how the understanding of this, all these 3D relationships of the white mother, or the, of the deep white mother fiber tracts can help us to understand not only the anatomical concepts, but especially how we have to focus to approach our patients uh, to get the best result for them, which is finally our goal. So, uh, we have already discussed this stuff, but I, I like to reinforce it. The, 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 the human brain is mainly composed of this cortical pallium. Pallium means external layer. So, this cortex, this gray mother, is covering all these white mother fiber tracts. And the cerebral substance, which is the underlying substance just behind this cortical pallium, is divided into the white mother and the deep gray mother. We are going to focus mainly on these uh, three types of fibers, association fibers, commissural fibers, and projection fibers. And I want to show you this slide uh, because this is very helpful, especially uh, to do the dissections in the, in the lab. You can see here a single gyrus, which has been coronally cut. So we can see the general, this is a scheme of the general arrangement of these fibers. So we have the short U fibers, connecting adjacent gyri, as you can see here. We have the long association fibers, which are connecting different areas inside the same hemisphere, different lobes mainly. And then we have this in a central position, mainly the projection and commissorial fibers. This is another scheme uh, of the same uh, thing, again to reinforce it, U fibers connecting adjacent gyri. We have the uh, projection and commissural fibers to different targets in the depth. And finally, all this substance here is mainly composed by the long fibers. These long association fibers, which are the ones we are going to focus in the next minutes. 
So which are these association fiber systems? So we have the so-called dorsal stream, which we are going to focus right now, and then we have the ventral stream, which will be covered in the next talk. Most of them, as you can see, are uh, about the dorsal stream, are related to language. So mainly we have the superior longitudinal fasciculus. Igor has brilliantly covered it already, but we will try to give a, a different focus to, to the same uh, fascicle. We have the arcuate fasciculus, which in fact is a part of the superior longitudinal fasciculus. We have the superior occipitofrontal uh, fasciculus and the new uh, so-called Aslan tract, which has been uh, recently uh, studied and we are uh, publishing many, many different functions and many, many things about it, which is a very exciting uh, topic. So the superior longitudinal longitudinal fasciculus is the main all of these dorsal stream fibers and it's called uh, 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 to have some functions as the motor initiation, emotions, uh, spatial attention and mainly language and memory in the so-called dominant hemisphere. This is what we are going to be covering in the next slides. The arcuate fasciculus is a very important part of the superior longitudinal fasciculus. It has this C-shape uh, around the, the lateral fissure, the sylvian fissure, and it's mainly connecting the so-called Wernicke's and Broca's areas. We will discuss them later on, and mainly is related to speech function. Superior occipitofrontal, we are not going to go too deep on it. And the Aslan tract, we will introduce a few slides about it. I will show you some interesting cases in which we, we found uh, some specific functions about mainly verbal fluency. So these are the three fascicles we will try to cover and we will compare, we will introduce on each of them anatomical dissections with uh, white fiber tractography because this is the, the way in which we have to think before approaching any single tumor in these regions. So uh, we have been covering uh, this tough topic, the white mother, in the last uh, one hour and I maybe you are a little bit sleepy so let me share with you this funny a video which uh, I think uh, it will help us to wake up a little bit. Can we have sound, please? This is the story about a Spanish guy uh, who was kidnapping an English guy and they were ready to kill him. So this is the English guy. He was screwed and the Spanish guy is coming now. The letter. Tell us where the letter is, or we are going to kill you. Kill. It's pronounced kill. Mr. Johnson, we've known each other since a long time. For a long time. Okay. For is used for a period of time, since is used for the starting point of an action. Don't correct me, you son of a bitch! Bitch. It's pronounced bitch. Relax your mouth and form a short vowel sound from the front of the mouth. Which? Which? Much better. Thanks. Okay, anyway, our spies have watched you all day, all night. We know you have the letter. Have been watching you. But this is present perfect. No, it's a present perfect continuous because you're emphasizing the duration of the action. Ah, <sighs> oh, yes. oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's a very interesting word called, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah, okay. <laughs> So I just wanted to make a, a joke and uh, to show you how language, which is a very, very, very specific function, probably the most developed function in the human brain, can help us to save our lives. So then, let's start with the superior longitudinal fasciculus study, and as Igor has highlighted, it's a very, very complex network of axons, which in fact, every year I check new uh, papers, new publications, it's going to be completely different stuff. So it's changing all the time because it's so complex that we are finding new and new functions and different components of this important fascicle. But uh, for a classical uh, uh, differentiation, the superior longitudinal fascicle has been classically divided in five components. So we have the SLF1, 
SLF2 and SLF3, which compose the horizontal dorsal stream mainly. The SLF1 is mainly located close to the midline, close to the cingulate bundle, and it's connecting, it's a horizontal bundle connecting the posterior part of the superior parietal lobe and some parts of the posterior cingulum together with the prefrontal areas and some of the supplementary motor areas. This is SLF1. SLF2 is a little bit more lateral at the level of the middle frontal gyrus, the, in the depth of the middle frontal gyrus, and mainly connects the so-called angular gyrus, you already know about it, which is posterior in the inferior uh, parietal lobule, running all anteriorly in order to join some prefrontal areas and also some opercular and paraopercular regions. And finally, more laterally, we have SLF3, which is mainly connecting the so-called supramarginal gyrus together with the opercular regions and the so-called preventral central area of the inferior frontal gyrus. We have two more components. We will discuss them later on about the superior longitudinal fasciculus. But this is a nice uh, MRI reconstruction of this tractography study in order to understand how SLF1, SLF2, and SLF3 are arranged in this way from medial to lateral. So we have SLF1 located almost in the midline, close to the cingulate gyrus, as you can see right here, connecting posterior parietal lobe with anterior frontal lobe. SLF2, again, connecting angular together with the middle and inferior frontal gyra, some connections to the supplementary motor area. And the SLF3, which is the most lateral of all of them, connecting the supramarginal gyrus anteriorly with the so-called uh, area of Broca and the precentral region. This is a nice study uh, from Fernandez Miranda. He's a Spanish guy who is working in Pittsburgh in which uh, they study the differences in between some of the subcomponents of this superior longitudinal uh, complex, fascicle complex. And as you can see, SLF2 and SLF3 are mainly connecting these posterior parts, both of them from angular in the left and right hemispheres and supramarginal, but anteriorly in the right hemisphere, there is only one single branch about the SLF3 going mainly to the parts opercularis and parts triangularis. However, in the left hemisphere, we have also these connections, but moreover, we have connections going to the middle frontal gyri, and some of them even reaching the supplementary motor area, which will be very important, as I will try to prove you later on. So let's try to translate all these tractography, these schemes, to the virtual uh, uh, XPBODA section, to the Klinger's method we will do la later on. And here, at the level of the inferior frontal gyrus, we can split the cortex at that level level and we can uncover part of the SLF2 and the SLF3 so we can see how they run anteriorly in this horizontal shape. So from angular and supramarginal anteriorly all the way to the middle superior and in front, inferior frontal gyri. So we will try to do a dissection like this later on in the, in the lab in order to understand this three-dimensional relationship. Let's introduce a clinical case. This is a 73 years old old man who came to the emergency room with some progressive speech problems. Mainly he had a, a motor problem. He couldn't speak properly. He couldn't elaborate properly the, the, the words. And as you can see, this lesion, I need your help to identify it. In which lobe do you think it is? Which lobe of the brain? En que lobulo? Frontal? Quantos para frontal? Parietal? Okay, so it's a limiting area, in fact, and mainly it's located, I would say, in the frontal lobe. You will see this is the inferior frontal gyrus. The, the key point is to have a look at the axial. Uh, it's very difficult to, to say with only one slide, I, I know that, but this is the precentral sulcus. So it's anterior to the precentral sulcus, and if we go to the coronal cut, we will see we have superior, middle, an inferior frontal gyrus. So it's located in the inferior frontal gyrus, most posterior part, these parts triangularis, these parts opercularis right here, this is the precentral, postcentral gyri. So this is located in a very, very specific area of the left hemisphere, which is the so-called preventral motor area. So this is a reconstruction of the lateral fissure of this, of this patient, some veins which are gonna be very helpful to, for surgical planning. And in this case, we decided not to do an awake surgery because the patient has a severe deficit perioperatively. So we cannot test many, many language tests. This is why we did a pure tumorectomy. And in order to do a pure tumorectomy in these high-grade gliomas, we have a very nice tool, which is uh, the Florence 
fluorescence uh, uh, surgery, as I will show you. This is the sylvian fissure. This is the precentral sulcus. So this is anterior, this is posterior, this is lateral, and this is medial. So this is this area, just posterior to parts opercularis in the most posterior part of the frontal lobe. So we open a little bit the arachnoid, we try to coagulate as many cortical vessels as we can, and we try to remove the pia. And with this tool, I will show you how useful it is. We give a medication to the patient before, and with this fluorescent light, we can see where the high-grade uh, part of this, of this tumor is located. So again, with the help of the fluorescence, we can guide our resection posteriorly. And here we have the motor fibers. So in case we see something quite clean enough like this, it's the moment to stop in a high-grade glioma in a patient with a deficit and 73 years old. So this is what we are doing, peer tumorectomies, and this was a GVM which was located mainly in this region of the brain. So deep there we have these fascicles we have been showing you. SLF3 mainly, and as we will show you later on, the horizontal component of the arcuate fascicle. So from anterior to posterior in the inferior frontal gyrus, we have the pars orbitalis, pars triangularis, pointing at the anterior sylvian point, pars opercularis, and the connection of pars opercularis together with the motor area. This is the precentral gyrus, and this is a very, very specific area of the brain known as the ventral precentral intersection area. And here we have some of the fibers we have been discussing, some mainly part of the superior longitudinal fascicle. So here, in the precentral gyrus and a little bit anteriorly, we have not only the U fibers, you know them already, connecting adjacent gyri, but also we have projection and commissural fibers, and most importantly, mainly fibers from SLF3 and the horizontal component of the arcuate fascicle, which is the fourth component of the superior longitudinal fasciculus. So in this dissection, we have gone a little bit deeper, and we are showing the arcuate fasciculus, which is, as we have already mentioned in the previous talk, surrounding or slipping, uh, wrapping around the lateral fissure and the insula. So this is the horizontal compartment, and this is the, this is the vertical component of this arcuate fascicle, which is very important for language in the left hemisphere, in the dominant hemisphere, sorry, because it's connecting this pars opercularis, or this brocas area, with the vernicus area, which is located mainly in the posterior part of the superior temporal gyrus and the supramarginal gyrus. So this is the fascicle connecting both of them. We can do a tractography, and uh, we are doing this high-resolution tractographies with a, with a special software, but the most important thing before doing these tractographies is to try to do the dissection to understand these 3D relationships, and then we can identify where these fibers are located in order to expose them in this, in this beautiful way. If we overimpose now the cortex, we understand, sorry, how this fascicle is deep to the inferior frontal gyrus, supramarginal gyrus, and the posterior part of the superior temporal gyrus. So this is the lateral fissure, and as you can see in the depth, this arcuate fascicle is wrapping around it, connecting brocas with vernicus areas. Well, if we want to, do, to, to go deeper in, the, in our understanding, we can divide the arcuate fascicle in three parts. Actually, this part is the classic uh, compar component of the arcuate fascicle, which is the orange one, which is connecting, as we said before, frontal and temporal lobes. We have also a vertical component, which is the most superficial. This is the first one we will try to uncover during the dissections, and is mainly joining the middle temporal gyrus together with the supramarginal and angular gyri, and it's covering the temporal frontal compartment, as you can see here. And finally, in green, we have the horizontal segment, which somehow it's intermingled with the SLF3. If you remember where the SLF3 is coming from, it's joining supramarginal together with the pars opercularis. So this horizontal compartment can be confused and intermingled with this SLF3. Well, so this is the virtual dissection we will try to do later in the lab. Here we have the cortex. Let's review it. Pars triangularis, opercularis, precentral, postcentral. This is the supramarginal gyrus, which can be identified if we follow the lateral fissure. Once it's done, once it's ending, we have this C-shaped gyri 
gyrus surrounding the end of the cilian fissure. This is supramarginal. And here, posteriorly, we have the so-called angular, superior temporal gyrus and middle temporal gyrus. So the first thing we will do is to uncover from the depth of the sulci to the surface, we will take, we will scratch away all the gray matter. And we will have something like this. So we will do it around, all around the superior temporal sulcus, inferior frontal sulcus, central area. We will not go too deep here. We will explain you why. And also around the supramarginal and angular. So once we have done this, one of the techniques, there are many techniques in order to uncover the superior longitudinal fasciculus, but as you saw, there are many different components, but an interesting one is to do a small cut here in the posterior part of T2. We cut it and then we dissect it and elevate it. And the first thing we will uncover is the vertical component of the arcuate fascicle. This vertical component is the most superficial one at that level, so we will be able to uncover it. Let's give a clinical uh, point of view to this. And this is a patient who came uh, to, the, to the emergency room after having a scissor. He was neurologically most or less intact, but after doing a neuropsychological study, we perceived that he had some language deficits, as we will show you later on. So this tumor is mainly located in the supramarginal gyrus, right here. So if we know the anatomy, as we have already been reviewing, deep to this supramarginal gyrus, we will have this arcuate fascicle. So this arcuate fascicle in the dominant hemisphere, in this case, was affected. This is why this patient was having these problems. So this is the surgery, and here I want to show you part of this superior longitudinal fascicle component. This is partially the arcuate fascicle, which is a little bit medial and posterior to this tumor. So it's running on that direction, and the tumor, it seems it's not invading it completely, but you can see a huge edema around it, and this is why the patient was having these problems. So this is a supramarginal gyrus, again, FAFLA. We do a cortical mapping, first of all. So we are checking the language and checking which is the best area in order to go inside the tumor. And we found some responses superiorly and posteriorly as we were expecting. So what, then we protect those regions and we concentrate on the only region in which we didn't find any problem. So let me show you what had the patient. This was 24 hours before surgery. We were doing some language tests and we were showing him some pictures. And in this case, this is a screwdriver. In Spanish, we call it destornillador. And look at what happened with, to him. ¿Podemos tener volumen, por favor? ¿Es posible tener sonido? So he couldn't see, he couldn't say the word. He couldn't say screwdriver. He was only saying uh, this tool to um, uh, screw screws. He couldn't see the word. This is called anomic aphasia. And the patient can recognize the object. He can understand what it is, but he cannot say the single word. He can explain it, even he can do this movement, but he cannot say the word. And ¿Cómo se llama? Perfect. This is six hours after surgery. Due to the edema and the mass effect, he was able to say that. In fact, when I showed him the picture, he thought, are you stupid? It's clear, this is a screwdriver. It's a very simple question. So this is what we can have after damage of the arcuate fascicle. This is one of the problems we can find. So this is the result. So you can see the supramarginal gyrus now much more clearly, which, coach, which was mainly pushed posteriorly. So this was the arcuate fascicle, which was affected in this case. Again, supramarginal gyrus. This is precentral, postcentral, and the most anterior part of the supramarginal was the bed of this tumor, which was affecting all the arcuate fascicle, but not destroying it. This is the arcuate component, which is joining, as you can see, wrapping around the insula, joining temporal with frontal areas, and we can translate, as Professor Destries showed us before, we can translate these tractography results to our anatomical dissections, which is gonna open us many, many doors in order to understand these deep relationships. This is the vertical segment. This is the first one we will try to dissect, cutting T2 and following the dissection superiorly. Here we have it. This is the most superficial part. And then we will try to uncover the horizontal segment of the arcuate fascicle, which is superficial also to the arcuate compartment of the arcuate. 
So here we have opened the posterior part of the frontoparietal operculum in order to show how elevating the horizontal compartment and these U fibers of the operculi, we can perceive in the depth the arcuate fascicle. So it's deep to this horizontal segment. Another case, in order to try to understand a little bit more this complex language network, this is a 57 years old man who came with some personality disturbances. That's all. Neurologically, he was intact. No problems with language, no problems with uh, movements. And you can see how this tumor is located in what we call the supplementary motor area. So this is a software we are using. It's called Osirix. It's a free software, and we use it uh, in order to uh, identify the depth location of our tumors. So this is pre-central, this is post-central, and this is the tumor located in the supplementary motor area. So we implement the venography, and we have a good idea about the relative location of this tumor, which is, and then we move this to our clinical picture, surgical picture, superior frontal sulcus, midline, and pre-central sulcus. So we can do an anatomical resection in this case. Everything went well, it was very nice. But the patient, he, he, he didn't have a, a, the so-called supplementary motor area syndrome, but he had, he had a kind of mutism. We were asking him some questions, and it was difficult for him to start talking. After a few seconds, he could say some brief words, but it was not very fluent. This is called uh, a damage of the verbal fluency, and at this time, uh, we were studying something known as the Aslan tract, which, which has been deeply studied in the last 10 to 12 years, which is connecting, as I will show you right now, mainly the supplementary motor area together with the so-called Broca's region. So this is a dissection in order to show you how this tumor was just medial to the SLF complex. It was locally, lo uh, localized right here, but the patient after surgery, he had a language deficit. Why did he have a language deficit? We know all the components of the SLF, and they were not close to this, to this tumor, but what happened is that probably we damaged this yellow fiber tract, which is the so-called Aslan tract. This Aslan tract is connecting the medial compartment of the superior frontal gyrus and the lateral compartment of it, together with the inferior frontal gyrus. And it has been uh, demonstrated, and we have been studying it, it's ha it has an important task on language on the dominant hemisphere. So this is what probably happened. We damaged these deep connections. This is a tractography, a uh, high-resolution tractography, to show you the relationship between the arcuate and SLF together with this Aslan tract. This is the so-called obliquio tract, because it's going obliquely, this is a tra obliquio trajectory from the superior frontal gyrus to the inferior frontal gyrus, as you can see in this picture. So it's just medial to our SLF complex, as we can understand in this tractography. This is another case, middle frontal gyrus lesion. This is the Aslan tract in this case, and we did a pure tumorectomy. In this case, we were aware of this, of this problem. So we did an anatomical resection, and this is the bed of the tumors. So we have the depth of the superior frontal sulcus, precentral sulcus, and this white mother substance is mainly located at this level. So we have to try not to go too deep in this, in this case. This is a dissection of the so-called Aslan tract. As you can see, how it has this obliquio direction for coming from the superior frontal gyrus to the inferior frontal gyrus. This is the so-called pars opercularis. You can see how these fibers, not only the projection and long posterior association, but also it has, it has some fibers coming from this uh, Aslan tract. This is an interesting case. Uh, this is an epilepsy, left frontal lobe epilepsy, and we are doing, in some certain cases, we are placing these deep electrodes mainly for recording, looking for depth uh, or deep fossy, uh, epileptic fossy, and also in order to identify which uh, structures we shouldn't touch during the disconnection surgery. And here we found something uh, interesting. So we do register and we do stimulation. So when stimulating this pole right here, the patient, he was a, a child, he had a kind of a speech arrest. He was not able to continue having a normal conversation. This is because we stimulated these fibers. So once we have this uh, pole uh, stimulating this area, we place a region of interest, interest right there, and we saw that we were stimulating this Aslan tract. So this give, gave us a very, very interesting uh, uh, view of, of, this, of this deep tract. 
This is a new tractography of the oblique fascicle in order to show you how it is medial to the superior longitudinal fascicle complex. And this is the last case I will show you. Uh, this case came to us uh, eight weeks, seven to eight weeks ago at the, uh, at the end of July. And he's a 38 years old uh, guy. He is a director of a theater plays, so he has to be very involved on language and writing, and he's also a, a character, so he needs, he really needs for his life language. And uh, he was perceiving, he had no scissors, he had no other problems, but he was perceiving that writing uh, plays, uh, a theater plays and opera plays was being very difficult for him, and uh, interpreting uh, as a character was being quite difficult for him. He was finding some difficulties. When I met him in the clinic, I had a normal completely normal conversation with him, but he was perceiving that uh, his skills with his job was, was not properly. So we performed an MRI, the neurologist did it, by the way, and this is what we found. It seems a very, very ugly tumor with enhancing areas there. there. It's mainly occupying the whole frontal lobe, and if we think about the Aslan tract, where do we think it is? It's completely invaded and probably destroyed. So in this case, uh, we decided to, to, to do a surgery, and again, we, we did our mapping. So this tumor is mainly in the superior frontal, middle frontal, inferior frontal partially, in the parts of percularis, and also crossing the midline to the uh, contralateral hemisphere. So this is a, a study of the right hemisphere in this patient in order to understand the 3D relationships. And this is what we did. We were exposing, this is the midline, anterior, lateral, posterior. We exposed the middle and the superior frontal gyri. We identified the precentral gyrus there. We always place this, this electrode in order to check the corticospinal tract. And we identified the tumor, the main part of the tumor with the ultrasound. And this is what we try to do in glioma surgeries. We try to, to open the arachnoid and to respect as much as we can the vessels, because some of these vessels are vessels in passage going to other important areas. So as much as we can, we try to, to respect them. So this is the middle frontal gyrus. And the interesting thing is that during the resection, this patient was not awake during the depth resection, and we are working with a suction device which in the tip we are stimulating, and the neurophysiologist told us that at that point I was showing you, she was finding some uh, uh, disturbances in the vocal cords motor problems in the vocal cords. And we are quite far away from the corticospinal tract, so it means maybe, I don't know, this Aslan tract could have some implications on motor speech also. This is what we found, and we have found something similar in another case, so we are trying to, to do our research about it. This is the CUSA we are using, so we are removing the tumor, and at the same time, we are stimulating in, the same, in certain areas, so this is how we can have a direct feedback about what we are doing, and we left, as you can see, this part of the, of the tumor. And the, well, this is the review of all the important uh, messages, just yes, to keep in mind that the dorsal association fibers are mainly involved in language. We have already reviewed them. We will try to, to uncover them in the lab. We have to be aware of the uh, different compartments or components of the superior longitudinal fasciculus and understand them separately, although they are a complex net. We will try to move later on to the lab to dissect as many of these fascicles as we can. And finally, we have to try to understand all these things, tractography, dissections, in order to offer the best to our patients. This is the guy uh, I was telling you uh, before. He's, an, uh, he's interpreting this opera. It's on YouTube, you can watch it. It's called El Balancin, and this is three months before surgery. Well, I suppose that's how it is in life. It's like a mierda of life. I do the things me levanto por la mañana apenas sin tiempo para el desayuno. Me das un beso y salgo pitando. ¿En la oficina? Por lo de siempre. Fernández se lleva todos los méritos y yo todo el trabajo. Esperando que algún día me llegue la hora. So this is our normal life. <laughs> so he was telling me that he was not feeling well. But when I saw this, this display, he, I thought that he was fantastic. Thank you so much. Any questions? Nuevamente agradecemos al doctor Pablo González López, neurocirujano del Hospital Alicante, España, 
y miembro del Comité de Anatomía Neuroquirúrgica de la Federación Mundial de Sociedades de Neurocirugía. Le vamos a brindar un fuerte aplauso nuevamente, por favor. Muchísimas gracias por estar esta mañana con nosotros en este seminario. A continuación vamos a recibir al doctor Ilés Samur, él es eh, profesor universitario del Hospital Pasioner, profesor universitario del Hospital Universitario de Tours en Francia. El tema que va a desarrollar es morfología y función de los fascículos. Recibimos, por favor, con un fuerte aplauso en esta oportunidad al doctor Ilies Samour. Good, good, um, okay. So um, thank you everybody to be here to, to listen to my talk uh, which uh, will focus on the other side of the hemisphere which has been presented by uh, Dr. Gonzalez uh, right now and uh, which is called the ventral stream. The ventral stream because it's located at the ventral aspect of the hemisphere Sorry, I look at, uh, I search for the pointer, okay. Um, so we just uh, talk about the dorsal stream, which is uh, the arcuate fasciculus and the, the front frontal aslant tract. And I will talk about the other three uh, main uh, association tracts that you can see here, that are the IFOF, the incinate, and the ILF. So, to begin, just a quick overview of these three uh, association tracts. So, I will, won't come back on the general organization of the hemisphere, but uh, just remember that we are talking about association. It means that that are tracts that connect the cortex to another part of the ipsilateral hemisphere. So the first and the biggest of the three uh, association tracts we're talking about is the inferior frontooccipital fasciculus, the IFOF, represented in blue here. It connects the frontal with the occipital and a little bit of the parietal lobe. It is um, made of three segments. The anterior segment is a fanning, an expanding portion of the tract and connects uh, most of the prefrontal uh, lobe. The second component is the trunk, which is a narrowing of the tract. And it is located into the external and the extreme capsule, which we will detail uh, just after. The posterior ending of this uh, tract is uh, also a fanning, an, expand, uh, an expansion of the fibers, which are uh, located mainly in the occipital, but also in the parietal lobe. The second um, tract we will focus on is the incinate fasciculus, which is a small fasciculus connecting the prefrontal lobe, the pole, with the temporal pole. And it has very close relationships with the, the IFOF just underneath the insula. Finally, we will uh, talk about the ILF, the inferior longitudinal fasciculus, which is located inside the temporal and occipital lobes, and which, is, uh, which we can separate uh, artificially into two segments, the anterior and the posterior segment. And these two segments are in very, very close relationships with the vi visual word form area, which is a cortex uh, uh, area located in the depth of a sulcus uh, between the third and the fourth temporal gyri, and which is dedicated to decoding letters into, le into, um, into words, it, which means it is very crucial for language, for written language, for reading. 
Now we will detail on dissections the different uh, morphological anatomy of this tract. So the first thing you have to do when you begin a dissection is to look at the sulci and, and the gyri and anatomy. Because as uh, Professor Maldonado told you, you will uh, destroy the surface of the hemisphere and then you won't be able to recognize these landmarks that are very important to, um, to, to recognize the location of the brain in where you are working, working on. So here is a detail of the main uh, sulci and gyri of the frontal lobe because the first uh, steps, uh, as uh, told you Professor Gonzalez, is to um, dissect the arcuate fasciculus which is very uh, superficial into the brain. But you have to focus also on the temporal lobe and so you begin your dissection at the posterior aspect of the lateral fissure or sylvian fissure. So you will uh, recognize the uh, posterior and vertical part of the arcuate fasciculus connecting uh, the supramarginal gyrus with uh, the posterior part of the temporal lobe. Then I uh, also put you the anterior part and the long part of the arcuate fasciculus here. So once you have done that, you can see that very superficially into the temporal lobe appears uh, horizontally oriented uh, fibers which are in fact the uh, first fibers you can see of the ILF, the inferior longitudinal fasciculus. So you have to go deep in, uh, um, on T2 and T3, the middle temporal gyrus and the inferior temporal gyrus and you can see that at the um, inferior end of the arcuate fasciculus, you have very difficult crossing fibers here, which means that you have uh, very uh, um, uh, important uh, connections between uh, the, these two fi uh, fiber tracts that made the dissection very difficult. So these are the three points uh, of the um, connections, of the main connections of the ILF. The visual world form area, which is in fact connected with the ILF and the arcuate fasciculus, and I told you, which is uh, located in the lateral temporo-occipital sulcus, which means between T3 and T4, between the inferior temporal gyrus and the uh, lateral temporo occipital uh, inferior uh, ventral uh, between the fusiform gyrus sorry so you have the anterior part of the ILF the posterior part of the ILF and the posterior part of the arcuate fasciculus and i insist on that fact that the visual world form area is an important crossroad between the ILF and the arcuate fasciculus very important for reading in the classical uh, descriptions of the ILF, uh, as you can see here, a description of Catani uh, using uh, diffusion tractography, uh, you have to keep in mind that you have most of the fibers that are U fibers, but you have also a, a contingent of fibers that are long fibers directly connecting the occipital pole to the temporal pole. I won't go further in the description of this uh, tract because it's a very complex anatomy and I think it's uh, too difficult for, for the purpose of this talk. So if we uh, go to the second uh, tract I want to uh, present you, it's the IFOF, the inferior fronto-occipital fasciculus. So you have to go deeper in the dissection, meaning you have to go and expose the arcuate fasciculus and then to completely expose the insula and then after removing the ILF and the insula you will expose the extreme capsule the extreme capsule which is I remember, uh, if you remember just uh, located between the insular cortex and the claustrum the claustrum which is this very small thin layer of grey matter between the insula and the lenticular uh, um, nucleus, which is uh, composed of uh, putamen and pallidum. So, in between the insular cortex and the claustrum, you find the extreme capsule. Uh, 
The extreme capsule is made of U-fibers, which means insulo-insular small fibers, but also of insulo-opercular fibers because, uh, as you can see here, the insula is connected with the frontal opercular and temporal opercular and with the parietal opercular posteriorly. Here is the uh, region that we call the limen insulae, which is the uh, hook uh, shake, uh, shape uh, connecting frontal with tempor temporal poles. So if you, you go deeper in the dissection, you will find that after having removing these U fibers, you find long association fibers, which, uh, 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 which we can divide between a ventral and a dorsal extreme capsule. So the dorsal extreme capsule connects the insula with and the claustrum with uh, the operculas, while the ventral extreme capsule is in fact the trunks of the IFOF and the incinate fasciculus that we will uh, better see when we go further during the dissection. What we can see here also is the two components of the claustrum. You can see that there are a clear difference between the dorsal portion of the claustrum, which is very compact, and the ventral portion of the claustrum, which is made of islands of grey matter. And if you look uh, very uh, carefully, you can see that the fibers of the IFOF and the incinate fasciculus cross these islands. This is why the IFOF and UF are both parts of the extreme capsule, but also of the external capsule. So if you go further into the dissection, you can see that you, you begin to, uh, to see the putem and the grey matter of the lenticular nucleus uh, by transparency uh, of uh, these uh, fibers that are now the external capsule. It means we are on, the in, on um, this very small layer between claustrum and putamen. And now you can see better the fibers oriented obliquely that form the IFOF and the incinate fasciculus. If you go further, you can clearly see now the gray matter of the putamen. As you can see here, we are on this big uh, gray nucleus, which is the uh, lenticular nucleus. So here is a representation uh, of a drawing that uh, you can uh, imagine. You have the insula, you have to remove the insula and in underneath the ventral third of the insula, you see the trunks of these uh, two major uh, fasciculus that we uh, are discussing now. The IFOF and the in uh, incinate fasciculus. Now, if we focus on the cortex and the cortical terminations of these fasciculi, first, the IFOF. Uh, it has been described as uh, uh, formed by two layers. The, the first is the superficial or dorsal layer of the IFOF, and the second will be the deep uh, portion. So if you go back, and do, of, uh, um, you have your dissection here, and if you go back, you can uh, follow the uh, terminations of your fibers, and you can see that the superficial dorsal IFOF connects with the inferior frontal gyrus, which is uh, um, uh, separated into the opercular, triangular, and orbitar pars. Concerning the deep part of the IFOF, the ventral IFOF, if you do the same and if you look at the uh, fibers, and if you go back um, with your dissection, you can see that it connects the orbital gyri, but also a big uh, amount of the middle frontal gyrus, F2, and the frontal pole at the level of uh, the connection between F2 and, F and F3. F3. Uh, if you do the same, but I won't do it uh, uh, for the posterior aspect, you can see that the superficial IFOF, the dorsal IFOF, connects with the parietal and occipital uh, superior gyri, while the ventral IFOF connects with the temporobasal cortex and ventral occipital cortex. Now we look at the 
incinate fasciculus and we uh, can focus on the region of the insula to look at uh, the uh, fibers and cortical connections of the uh, incinate fasciculus. So here is the insula before you remove the cortex of the insula. You have the insula apex, which is the most lateral part. You have to imagine that the insula is a kind of pyramid, and this is the, uh, the top of the pyramid. And this is called the insula apex, which is a bit uh, lateral and uh, dorsal to the limen insula. So if you remove the cortex and if you go uh, a little bit further when you have removed the U fibers, you can see the claustrum and the fibers of the IFF that uh, you can begin to, uh, to identify. And some, uh, you, you will find the incinate fibers just here, connecting the frontal pole with the temporal pole. So here uh, you can see the first fibers of the incinate fasciculus. And you can see them very nicely here. As, as, uh, as you go further with your dissection, the fibers uh, are becoming very clearly uh, and easily identifiable. So just a reminder, you have here the putamen and the external capsule. And if you look at this uh, superior aspect of the putamen, remember that you have the uh, in, uh, internal capsule just underneath, and which means that these fibers are the corona radiata. Okay? Now you, you have, um, you have uh, very close relationships between the trunk of the IFOF and the trunk of the incinate fasciculus. You do not have a real uh, anatomical landmark that can help you to separate both, only you have to look at the orientation of your fibers to see if they belong to the incinate fasciculus or if they belong to the IFOF. And now you can see here uh, at the level of the putamen the fibers that go to the inner part of the um, lenticular uh, nucleus, which means that they are part of the internal capsule. And as I told you before, the ventral claustrum is very uh, uh, is not as compact as the dorsal claustrum, and you can see that fibers cross this grey nucleus, which is made of small islands. Okay, so we have done uh, the major part of the talk, which is uh, about morphology of the tracts. Now we will focus on the function of this tract. And the first uh, uh, tract I will talk about you is the ILF. So we use mainly uh, uh, papers uh, using direct electrical stimulation to, uh, to know this uh, function, uh, functional anatomy. And when you focus on the posterior part of the ILF, you can see that it is mainly involved in reading. Reading all kinds of words, meaning regular words, irregular words, or pseudo words. Regular words are words that you can easily uh, decode, uh, um, that, has, that have uh, the same pronunciation as they are written. Irregular words means that you do not pron pron pronounce them, as they are written, and we have many uh, examples in uh, in French. Uh, I don't know if you have many in Spanish, but in, to, in in English and in French, there are many many irregular words, meaning that you have to to know the meaning of the word before you pronounce it, because you do not pronounce it as it is written. Okay. So all these kind of words, and so the words are words that do not exist. It's only an uh, uh, a succession of syllabs that do not uh, form a real word that has a meaning. So, if you uh, section or if you uh, stimulate with electricity uh, the, infer the posterior part of the ILF, you will have disturbances in reading all kinds of words because, in fact, this posterior part of the ILF allows the transfer of visual inputs that come from the occipital left occipital cortex and go to the visual world form area where these letters are decoded into words. So you can have a complete, which is called a complete alexia, meaning you have an alexia uh, difficulties in reading for all these kind of words. You cannot encode letters into words. 
Now, if you focus on the anterior part of the ILF, we know that it is involved in semantic processing. Semantic processing, uh, which we can um, uh, find during surgery as uh, semantic paraphasia when we stimulate this part of the uh, ILF. S semantic paraphasia, meaning that you cannot access the uh, the lexic of your word, and you have uh, difficulties to translate, uh, to, to find the, the name of the picture in, uh, in a denomination um, uh, picture. Me meaning you can find that it is uh, an animal, but you do not, re you do not have the access to the, real, to the adequate word, uh, uh, the lion. So you can say this is a tiger, this is a cat, this is an animal. You do not have any difficulty to pronounce words, but you do not find the good word. And you do not have any reading impairment when you focus, when you stimulate or section this part of the ILF. So, uh, a summary of the reading network. This is uh, the posterior part of the ILF uh, allowing visual input, and you do not have any uh, kind of compensation for this uh, uh, function. The visual word form area will decode letters into words. The anterior ILF uh, allows a semantic processing, but you, we know that it is compensable by the IFOF, which is the other uh, tract. And you have also a phonological processing of the word you want to read aloud, uh, which is uh, uh, the function of the arcuate fasciculus. Now, the IFOF, so the, big, the biggest of the three uh, tracks we are talking about, is involved in semantic processing. So the best way to, um, to assess this function during uh, the surgery is to use a denomination uh, task, and uh, when the patient, so it is the same as uh, for I ILF, you can have semantic paraphasia, or um, at the maximum of the disturbance, you can have a complete anomia, the patient cannot uh, uh, pronounce any word. But you also have a non-verbal -semant non semantic processing. And this non-verbal semantic processing can be assessed with uh, different type of tasks. The most uh, usual is the PPTT, which is a pyramid and palm tree test. Sorry, it, we, this is a T here. So the pyramid and palm tree test is uh, um, this kind of images. You have, the patient has to link the images of the top with one of the two of the um, uh, inferior part of the image. So you know, uh, it's uh, quite obvious here, you have to uh, link the palm tree with the pyramid and not the pine with the pyramid. But with this, two, with this task, you can assess non-verbal semantic. The patient doesn't have any words to, to find, it just has to find uh, the left with the, with the up or the right with the up. Another function of the IFOF is awareness, which means that when the patient does an error and when we, f when we stimulate the IFOF, the patient is not aware of the error, which means it ha he has anosognosia. And the last function of the IFOF that I will discuss here is inhibitory control, which is a, a perseveration during uh, electric stimulation of this uh, tract. For example, if, we, uh, if the patient has this image and calls this is a lion, it's okay, then you stimulate the IFOF, you present him this kind of image, and he will to te will tell again, this is a lion, it's a perseveration. Okay, he, is, uh, he stays on the uh, previous image. And this perseveration generally will, uh, will last uh, two or three uh, images. So in 10 or 20 seconds, it will, be, it will come back and the patient is okay. Concerning the incinate fasciculus, um, during surgery you have less uh, disturbances, but we know that it is linked to the limbic system and related with the emotion and memory, and also involved in the semantic processing, name, uh, and um, uh, proper names uh, is the main uh, semantic processing uh, that uh, is used by the incinate fasciculus. 
So these were uh, dissection and uh, drawings, but uh, we are most used to with the slice anatomy when we are surgeons or neuro neurologists because we use MRI. And this is uh, so the, the method we used uh, that has been presented by Professor Destrieux. But just um, if you look at a slice, coronal slice of the frontal lobe, you can see that the IFOF is located in the depth of the uh, white matter and connects with the uh, ventral part of the frontal lobe, but also with the frontal pole and with the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is the uh, frontal medial gyrus. If you have a section uh, that passes through the anterior part of the insula, you can see the incinate fasciculus on both parts of the uh, limen insulae and the IFOF just uh, underneath the insular cortex uh, between insula and putamen. And you can see at the ventral part of the temporal lobe the ILF. When you focus on the posterior part of the uh, ventral stream, you can see that the IFOF is here, just uh, with a small amount of uh, white matter between the IFOF and the ventricle, which are um, some other, uh, other fibers that I don't discuss today, but which are the tapetum, which is a, a part of the fibers of the corpus callosum, and the optic radiations. And all these uh, fibers uh, that are or sagittally, horizontally oriented form the stratum sagittale. It means that all the fibers that you can find laterally to the ventricle are part of the stratum sagittale unless the arcuate fasciculus that has vertically oriented fibers. So to finish, just quickly, uh, three kind of uh, surgical consequences that you have to uh, that can be uh, applied to this anatomy. First, when you perform a temporal lobectomy, you will have uh, uh, on the left side uh, landmarks that are delimited with these uh, white matter fibers. The most important landmark is the, the is the IFOF. Uh, that you want, uh, uh, that you don't want to cut, because it's involved in many semantic processings, as I told you before. And you can remove the temporal pole, uh, because you know that uh, the uh, incinate fasciculus, when you have only uh, unilateral damage of the in incinate fasciculus, usually you, the patient has no deficit. The same for the ILF, meaning that you can compensate the semantic function of the ILF using the IFOF. So you can cut the ILF on the uh, anterior part of the ILF during a temporal lobectomy. What is important to keep in mind is the posterior uh, landmark of your uh, temporal lobectomy, which is in fact the connection between the arcuate fasciculus and the visual world form area which is very important for reading, but which is also uh, an area very important for talking. So if you look at uh, coronal slices, during your temporal lobectomy at the anterior part of the temporal lobe, you won't have any difficulties to find the junction between the insula and the ventricle. And you know that all that is un uh, over um, this uh, line, you do not have to touch it because it's the IFOF and the optic radiations. The ILF, you can remove it. The hippocampus, you can remove it, and you can go uh, until the, you can see the optic tract here, meaning that you can have a, a very wide um, temporal lobectomy at the anterior part of the temporal lobe. When you go at the posterior part of the temporal lobe, you have this posterior limit, which is the visual world form area located in the uh, sulcus, le, delimitating the, temp the temporal inferior temporal uh, gyrus and the fusiform gyrus. And you also have your limit, which is the arcuate fasciculus here. When you, look at, when you have to perform a surgery at the posterior part of the temporal and occipital lobes, you're, you have the same landmarks. The anterior landmark is the visual world form area. The superior landmark is the IFOF. When you remove the posterior part of the occipital lobe, of the ILF, 
you know on the left side that you will induce or uh, the patient will not uh, uh, manage uh, uh, reading disturbances. But it's a kind of uh, compromise between the interest of the surgery and the deficit you induce with surgery. And finally, the last uh, uh, surgical consequence I will talk to you is the, when you uh, have to perform a frontal lobectomy, you can remove the entire part of the, inf of the incinate, you can remove some parts of the IFOF, but you have to keep in mind that it's very important to, uh, to, um, to respect the posterior uh, connections of the IFOF which are in fact the connections uh, very uh, important with the, the frontal aslant tract, with the articulate fasciculus, and which are very important for reading um, especially. So take home messages. First for morph morphology. The first uh, and most superficial uh, tract is the ILF, and you have to remember that it is connected with the visual word form area, this very important cortical part of the brain for uh, decoding letters into words, meaning for reading. Then, if you want to uh, find the trunks of the IFOF and of the incinate fasciculus, you will have to remove the insula. So remember, it is located at the inferior and anterior part of the insula. These two trunks of the IFOF and UF are parts of the extreme and ex external capsules. And finally, another important uh, morphological um, data to remember is that these fibers are horizontally oriented here, fibers of the IFOF, of the ILF, and form and are a part of the stratum sagittale. Considering function, so this is a quick overview of what we have already discussed. Function of uh, the posterior part of the ILF is reading, and you can induce complete alexia. Of the anterior ILF is semantic processing, but it's compensable by the IFOF. Of the IFOF is mainly important in, involved in semantic, verbal and non-verbal, but also in motor control, awareness and spatial cognition. And incinate fasciculus is involved in em emotion and uh, memory and semantic processing. In practice, white matter is very important, as we already told you uh, since the beginning of the session. And when you know the anatomy and you know the function, the, the function it's easier to prevent the deficits during surgery. It's easier to tailor the resection, meaning for glioma surgery, you will discuss, discuss the extent of your resection, or for metastasis, for example, you can discuss the approach by which uh, part of the brain you will approach uh, deep uh, metastasis, or uh, you can discuss also if you, have, if you are allowed to take margins around the metastasis, because you know that when you take margins, you have better chances to not have a recurrence after surgery. So thank you for your attention, and have a nice day. Thank you, Professor Zamora. So, any questions, Professor Zamora? Uh, can we turn the lights on, please? Uh, the lights of the room. Bueno, nuevamente muchísimas gracias a nuestros expositores. Vamos a brindarles un fuerte aplauso, por favor. Gracias por estar esta mañana. A los cuatro expositores que han estado con nosotros esta mañana. Eh, queremos mencionarles de que vamos a tener ya un receso, por favor. Vamos a pedir que todas las personas... Eh, al salir después tienen que devolver sus eh, auriculares, sus intercoms, para que puedan recoger lo que significa sus... Eh, vamos a pedir que nos puedan prender las luces, por favor. Ahora sí. Vamos a pedir que nos habiliten el micrófono, por favor.
Sí. Ya tenemos el micrófono habilitado. Por favor, si podemos habilitar este micrófono. Ahora sí, ya está. So, as I told you at the beginning, you were changed the program a little. So, the dice sessions for those who will be involved in the dice sessions will be concentrated in the afternoon. So, we're not going to have a break now. We will have a, just a break just at the end in some minutes. So, we're going straight forward to some uh, different interactive activities now. So, who are the neurosurgeons in the room? Please raise your hand. Neurosurgeons, neurosurgeons. Okay. So, any questions, any question, Professor, Professor Zemura? None. Okay. So now we are going to ask questions to you. Okay. So it's it, it must be interactive. It must be friendly. Don't worry about that. Let's try to uh, in, uh, interact. So the first uh, part or quizzes. It means that you have uh, structures to recognize. And then at the end, we'll have uh, some uh, educative, simple cases for discussing with uh, neurosurgeons that are in the room. Okay? Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Igor. Um, but with the lights on, uh, I think uh, no one can see what's on the screen. So maybe you have to turn off the light again. I'm sorry, because uh, for interaction, it's difficult to be in the dark. But. Vamos a pedir, por favor, si nos pueden apagar las luces de aquí del medio, por favor, para que podamos ver la proyección. Ahora sí. Ok. So this is a direct application of what I've just told you about uh, temporal lobectomy. So at the end of the resection, and here is a, an awake surgery which was performed in Montpellier with uh, Professor Dufault. Uh, after the resection of a temporal lobe, you have some landmarks. It means that during surgery, we found some functional disturbances uh, which uh, allowed us to, uh, to, to say we have to stop the resection here unless the patient will become aphasic or we have reading or we have a motor deficits. So the first question is, do you, after all the talks you had this morning, uh, can you imagine what kind of deficit we had when we stimulated the uh, 50 uh, in index. So you have a, sorry, so you have a, uh, the drawing here so you can, it can help you and if someone wants to propose uh, something don't be afraid, I won't bite you. No? So you remember we are in the temporal lobe and in the temporal lobe, uh, we have this, so this is a surgical view, huh? you imagine the hemisphere is a reverse. So you have uh, main uh, ventral stream tracts, the ILF, the incinate fasciculus, and the IFOF. And we are close to this region here, meaning that we are here at the temporal lobe, posterior part of the temporal lobe. Here is the sylvian fissure. Here is the frontal lobe with the motor um, responses at the beginning of the awake surgery. Here is a deficit of uh, uh, denomination. And here is, at the end of the resection, an error uh, concerning verbal and non-verbal error, uh, semantics. And if you remember which uh, uh, tract is involved in verbal and non-verbal semantic processing, but it's, I think it's too easy, so that's why you don't want to answer. No? It's the IFOF. The IFOF, the in inferior fronto-occipital fasciculus, which is this tract connecting frontal pole with the, temp with the occipital and parietal regions, 
and is located just here. In green here is, in fact, what we can see on the picture here is the ventricle, the ventricle that has been opened. And on the roof of the ventricle, on the white matter, at the depth of the ventricle, you find the IFOF. So now that you have located the IFOF and the problem uh, of the uh, semantic processing, can you uh, imagine what you can get here when you uh, stimulate the posterior part of the posterior margin of your temporal lobectomy? Anyone wants to try? Any of the neurosurgeons uh, that has raised their hand, had their hands? No. Okay, so we are here at the posterior part of the landmark, and. If you remember, this is the region of the visual world form area, meaning that when we stimulate here and when you ask the patient to read something, to read a word, he is not able to read irregular words. And so you are at the level of the visual world form area. Okay? The visual world form area, which is this region connecting the arcuate fasciculus and the posterior part of the ILF. So I have uh, another case uh, in relation with the temporal occipital junction. So this was a patient uh, uh, suffering a low-grade glioma of the posterior part of the temporal lobe, mostly in the occipital lobe, on the left side. And during surgery, we can, uh, at the stimulation of the depth of the cavity, induce uh, some kind of deficits. Can you imagine what kind of deficits? I didn't hear. Visual deficit? In fact, it could, uh, it, it could have been possible, visual deficit, but more in the depth. We, we, we went, uh, until we went uh, so uh, deep here. Here is still the problematic of the IFOF and the verbal, non-verbal semantic processing. Because here you can see uh, the, okay, so the, uh, the, I don't know. see the, the landmark here, and the 10, the number 10, is not uh, so deep, so you cannot have a visual deficit, but you have uh, the IFOF here more superficial. And the second question is, when you do this kind of resection, what will you have post-operatively? Uh, I'm not talking about visual deficits, so, but most of uh, the problematic of the association tract So I've already told you many times, the problem when you cut the posterior part of the ILF is that you remove the visual inputs of the occipital cortex that go to the visual world form area, meaning that postoperatively you know that you will induce a pure alexia for this patient because you are on the left side and because you cut the posterior part of the ILF. Okay, you see the visual art form area was here. We had reading disturbances when uh, stimulating the cortex at this level. And when we cut the ILF here, we induce a pure alexia, which means an alexia for all kinds of words. And here is a drawing that can help you to understand, meaning that you remove the connection between the cortex, even if you have preserved the occipital cortex, if you remove the connection, the cable, that uh, the wires that uh, connect the occipital cortex with the visual world form area, even if these two structures are um, preserved, you do not have the connection, so you do not have the uh, possibility to decode letters into words and to read. Okay, you have a small amount of the visual field of the other side that can uh, create an incomplete compensation 
but it's very difficult for the patient to read because this compensation is very poor and is uh, the, the patient uh, has to read letter by letter and he has to read aloud letter by letter and then to decode very, very slowly. Uh, maybe I can pass uh, to Christophe or to Igor for the next. Yes. So it's very simple, very fast. Uh, oh. No. Don't worry about the colors. Um, this, uh, I have two uh, messages about this case. Very, really simple. One first message is about anatomy, of course. The other message is about the circumstances. I'm not going into the discussion if. Uh, you know, you should do it awake, not awake. It's a bigger discussion. I'm not going to do it now. But it's a, I put some pictures, because those are pictures of the place in which I did that case seven years ago. You know, it was in South America. You, you see the red dot there in Brazil. Also not, not a rich hospital. A touristic place, nice beaches, and with a lot of social problems. So uh, it was possible anyway. The case was uh, addressed by a colleague neurosurgeon who came with us to the operating room with a patient with this, that small tumor and the white matter in the Semovol center, right? So um, that's more or less the uh, anatomical projection uh, in which Gyros would say that it is. In which lobe? Is this temporal, parietal or frontal? Parieto, thank you, gracias. So let's try to find our landmarks. Uh, one thing is the central sulcus here, right? So it's behind the central sulcus and it's, uh, it can't be frontal, right? So uh, of course it's difficult with a single um, image, uh, but if you look at different uh, images in the horizontal plane, you can recognize your uh, central sulcus and then follow uh, up to the image of your tumor. Or the thing is, which sulcus is this? Is the lateral sulcus, Sylvan Fisher, right? So it will help. Which gyros is this? Horse-shaped, was very well. Supermarginal. It's a center at this level of supermarginal gyros. So it's interesting for uh, anatomical relationships because um, there is probably when uh, this tumor is going to be operated, we'll have it's on the left side, so we'll have uh, languages areas maybe around it, maybe here, right? Posterior temporal, posterior superior temporal lobe, Wernicke areas, Wernicke's area, but we we'll also have a white matter on the depth of the cavity. So the question is, before operating it on, what, what which is the uh, white matter structure? we'll find in the depth of the cavity. You, you don't need to answer it now, let's see. So one problem of the, this case is, uh, I was just getting back to that city, you know, seven years ago, and uh, I didn't have at that time people to discuss with and you say, oh, let's do it. So uh, this one of the, the first cases I, I, said, uh, I did in Salvador in a wake surgery, we had to train our personal. This was the speech therapist at that, at that time. She had never seen a procedure like this. This is a, just a simple video of the... Uh, can you turn the sound on? Oh, I don't have enough cable. It doesn't matter. It was a very simple video uh, of the guy speaking in Portuguese. And uh, at a given point, uh, 
of the uh, resection, he did uh, what we call a phonological mistake. It means that he was speaking well, but at the level of the cavity, he was uh, misspelling words. It meant, uh, for example, for telephone, he would say letephone, for elephant, he would say effalent, or things like that. So you, have, uh, you had a nice uh, lectures about these bundles and the functions, so try to think a little bit about which uh, bundle would be implicated on that, you know? It was still more or less artisanal at the time, with the tags doing by hand. And uh, the next video will be more interesting if you have sound. Entendeu? Como eu falava na infância, uma corda de pular. Urso! Não sei se é branco ou é preto. Lê a frase também. Isto é. Isso é uma chela. Uma. Ó. Cronológico. Peraí, deixa eu falar. Segura aí, aperta o botão aí, doutor. Eu quero falar. Não tem ah, problema, ah, não. Continua. Porra, aí, peraí, rapaz, eu preciso falar. Segura a onda aí. Bom, uh, he, he noticed that he made a mistake and he was asking us to stop. So, the, the interesting thing is the mistake he did. He was uh, uh, trying to say the word refrigerator, which in Portuguese is geladeira. But he said geladeira. So, uh, we were there at the depth of the cavity. And we were performing a simulator and per electric perturbation of this region. We don't need to perform the dissection of his brain or to do tractography for that. The structure is there. Which one will be? Which fasciculus? Would it be IFOF? Would it be uncinate? Would it be projection fibers, you know, internal capsule? It's arcuate fasciculus, right? So that's the main message. You have arcuate fasciculus here. In this parasagittal slice, you can imagine it's there. So when you see the lesion, you see the supramarginal gyrus, you see the tumor, you start to imagine it that when you will be in the depth, you will be dealing with arcuate fasciculus with superior frontal longitudinal fasciculus complex. Right? So if I put the dissected specimen, we have it, right? But when we're looking at MRI, mainly if you don't have a tractography, we see amorphous white matter. So you try to imagine where the structures are, even if you don't see them. You know, at that time, we didn't have, for that patient, for example, no tractography, no neuronavigation, you know? Only simulation, ultrasound, anatomy. And something interesting about this case specifically, that he did this dysgraphia. He was also uh, misspelling words in written language. And we didn't test it during surgery. We noticed it afterwards. So, uh, some taking home messages. Go beyond the tractography. Think functional. Think the structure you have there, but also thinking the function. It was very well explained by Ilias. Uh, of course, you think about connections in white matter. Explore all the limits of the operative cavity and uh, before exploring the limits, even before operating your patient, think about the functional anatomy you have around. Uh, mapping can increase your volume of resection and of course can reduce your, the, uh, um, the risk of uh, permanent deficits. And keep in mind the limits of the technique. Even, even though we are showing you very interesting, sometimes impressive cases of uh, pa awake patients, it also have some, uh, how can we say, uh, uh, I forgot the word, you know, it may be s tricky sometimes. For example, in this case, okay, we're not testing written language and he had temporary written uh, test, uh, deficits. Okay, let's move forward. Pablo, uh, you have a case? For the... Uh, Neurosurgeons or eventually uh, neurologists, if you have, we have in the room, don't hesitate to participate. You know, this moment is for that. You can point your finger and say, "What is that?" And uh, I would not have done this way. You know, we are here for this kind of a discussion.
Okay, so first of all, uh, try to look at only one of the slides. This is a 3D slide. I, I, I didn't have time to, to, pre to prepare it in 2D. But let's try to discuss again anatomical concepts, mainly anatomical concepts. So this is a 63 years old lady. She had a breast tumor and she came uh, with headache to our clinic. And uh, based on the MRI findings, I would like you to help me to try to identify where is this tumor located, in which lobe, first of all. Parietal, perfecto. So this is parietal lobe, and parietal lobe has a medial surface and a lateral surface. In which surface would you say it's located? Medial or lateral? Medial, perfect. So whenever you, you have problems with identifying where the tumor is located, something very good is going to the healthy hemisphere. So here we can see in the coronal that the superior parietal lobe is completely pushed superiorly, but it's intact. Can you see it there? And don't forget that this seems a metastasis. So it's probably pushing the tissue. It's not invading the neurons. So the lateral aspect of the parietal lobe is pushed superiorly. It means that the tumor is growing in the so-called medial aspect of the parietal lobe. And I need you to help me identifying these one, two, three structures. What is this? This is the parietal lobe. Well, this is so, the so-called paracentral lobule, which is the medial expression of the central lobule, of the precentral and postcentral. So in a sagittal slice, if you follow posteriorly the cingulate sulcus, once it goes up, we have the so-called marginal cingulate sulcus. So everything anterior is the so-called paracentral lobule, with the motor area and the sensory area. And just behind, we have a quadrangular shaped structure. Do you know the name of this? Precunio, perfect. Why it's called precunio? Because posteriorly we have the cuneus. Cuneus is a triangular shape, it's a cuña. So this is why it's called cuneus. And just separating the precuneus and the cuneus, we have a very deep sulcus. What's its name? Parieto occipital, perfect, because it's separating the medial aspect of the parietal from the anterior aspect of the occipital, which is the cuneus. So we are identifying more or less the structures here, and we also have a kind of sulcus right here, which is the so-called subparietal sulcus, separating the precuneal region from the posterior cingulate gyrus. So this tumor is mostly arising exactly in this region, in the so-called ismus. The ismus is a pivotal junction between the cingulate gyrus and the parahippocampal gyrus. And something important to know about it, once we want to approach it, is to know that there is a relevant anatomical and functionally relevant structure here, which is the name of this fissure. Calcarin, perfect. And which function we have there? ¿Cuál es la función de la cisura calcarina? Visual, perfect. So these are all the regions we must be aware of. So once we have, uh, we have identified our anatomy, if we look at the images, we have a big tumor, which is very close to the surface here. So it could be very comfortable to do a craniotomy right there and to directly approach it. But the problem is that although we cannot see a big tissue big mass of tissue there, all the superior parietal lobe, as the tumor is growing here in the ismus, all the superior parietal lobe is pushed superiorly. This is the left hemisphere, so we have many functions there. We have also talked about the superior longitudinal fasciculus. All these fibers are compressed there. So it's much easy to go through the interhemispheric fissure because we are going to approach directly the tumor, and as this is a metastasis, we can save all these fibers. So let me show you, I don't know, know if I have a video. Well, this is the surgical position we are using because in some cases, what we do in order to enter the interhemispheric fissure is to study the venous uh, anatomy. So sometimes if the venous anatomy is more likely to go inside 
through the interhemispheric fissure in the contralateral aspect, we do it through that point in order to avoid damaging the veins. So in this case, there were more favorable veins in the contralateral aspect. So the tumor is left, the tumor is here, but we are going to split the right interhemispheric fissure. This is why we place the patient in this position because the gravity, once we open the fissure, the right hemisphere is going to go down, 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 and we have much better access to approach this tumor. So this is the craniotomy. Let me have a good orientation. This is midline. This is the right parietal lobe. This is anterior. This is posterior. And this is lateral. So we are going to open the dura on this way. We will move it medially. And then we start splitting the fissure. You can see the venous anatomy was quite tough also in the right hemisphere, but in the left was even worse. So we just have to take time, dissect these veins to create space enough. And which is this structure, this white structure here? This is the falx. So we open the falx, we can check it with the ultrasound easily. We open a small window to work in. And as this is a metastasis, it was coming to the sulcal surface. So the metastasis is arising here, right here. So we have a direct access to the metastasis, avoiding the damage of this area of the brain. Can you tell me which is this area of the brain? It's pushed superiorly and mainly anteriorly. That's the paracentral lobulu, so the sensory area. So this is the ascending ramus of the cingulate sulcus, and this is why it's so relevant to try to do an anatomical approach. So this is why we decided to do all on this way. And this is a nice picture. This is only 24 hours after surgery. You can see all these superior parietal lobule fibers, only 1.2 centimeters before surgery, and only 24 hours later, we have 2.6. So it means that we have many, 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 many white mother fiber tracks there. It's easy to go for this case in this direction, and probably we can be lucky and avoid damaging the patient, but it's much better to go in an anatomical fashion. One more case, Igor. Thank you, Pablo. Questions? So we will uh, soon close this, this session. I think there is somebody from Universidad del Valle who wants to uh, make an announcement. Vladimir? Vladimir, yes. you want to close the session? You want to close the session? Oh yes, why not? <laughs> <laughs> I did nothing from the morning, so <laughs> thank you for coming here and thank you for listening to extraordinary lectures by all these guys and uh, enjoy the lunch. Is there lunch now? Okay, enjoy lunch. Muy buenos, buenos días. A nombre de la Universidad Privada del Valle quisimos agradecer la presencia de ustedes todos. Los participantes, les vamos a invitar a que salgan por favor por la puerta a mi izquierda. And we would like to invite our foreign guests for the, towards the VIP room, please, so you can have some refreshments.